Lord so that uh, we can continue to uh, look for resources that enable us to carry out evidence-based kinds of projects in the community. Couldn't agree with you more. It's time for us to take a short break and when we return we will continue the discussion of the future of senior services. Please stay tuned. We'll be right back. Just a minute. <laughs> It's that time of year again to clear all that annoying dry brush from around your house. In the event of a fire, dry brush is extremely combustible and can explode. By clearing brush 200 feet from your home, you create a barrier, lessening the likelihood of spreading a fire. I'll still be here when you get back. Get the message. Be prepared. Welcome back to Aging in LA. I'm Paul Peterson and today we are discussing the future of senior services and how we can continue to provide for an ever-growing number of seniors with decreasing resources from our governments. Our guests include our good friend Laura Trejo, General Manager of the Los Angeles Department of Aging, Dr. Marie Torres, Senior Vice President of Government Relations at the Ultimate Health Services, Enrico Saborio, Executive Director of St. Barnabas' Senior Services. Laura, back to you. Enrico mm -hmm. brought this up before the break. How do we marshal those very people that we serve so they can be a more effective political voice? Uh, I think that we have various uh, tools that we can be using. Mm -hmm. uh, disseminating information is critical. One of the things that we did uh, recently when the governor released his uh, proposed budget, we actually informed seniors across the, the entire region. And they uh, showed up, didn't they? And they actually, <laughs> more than showed up, uh, we had over 27 senior centers in Los Angeles County holding uh, demonstrations outside of their centers where mm -hmm. Over 3,500 seniors participated uh, in a, what we were calling a stand-in uh, in front of the centers. Uh, we were uh, really uh, pleasantly surprised at the level of willingness of older adults uh, to be engaged in protecting the services that they were utilizing and that they need or that they anticipate needing in the future. Right. Uh, their, uh, their stories were very, very eloquent uh, and I think very much to the point that this is what keeps them at home, it keeps them independent. Right. Um, so we've begun to really look at older adults themselves. We need their voices, yeah. we need their families, and we saw the tremendous outpouring of support. And so that gives us, uh, I think, the impetus to continue to de uh, develop uh, those opportunities for the community to be involved themselves. And so right. we're very proud of, of sort of the direction we're heading and trying to educate the public about the impact that these cuts will have on their lives. Right. I, exactly. And uh, nobody gets to sit this one out. No. No. There is no place in, no. in, in our society, top to bottom, no matter where you live, Correct. where you're going to escape the consequences of these kind of budgetary cuts on people we care about. Yes who work their whole lives with the expectation, and I think it's a reasonable expectation, of having someone to care for them. Correct, right. We Paul, know this. Yes. Paul, can I just mention, because of course we, we were uh, one of, we had several of our centers do the stand-ins, but right. we also, one of the techniques that we used uh, with our seniors at our various adult day health care and care management programs is that we mobilized them to, we would provide transportation and we would just show up to the office of the elected official. No mm -hmm. appointments. Okay. No, no, they loved it. They yeah. loved it. We would go in there full force, eight to ten at a time maybe, right. and we would tell our stories. The clients would share their stories. It got very emotional sure. uh, at times for the clients to share their stories because many of them are very sick and frail and have disabilities and so they, when the staff would be meeting or the elected official, I mean they were just overwhelmed to see that people would just be showing up every every hour, every couple of hours we had another group go in. And okay. I think that was very effective. It was very effective and, and it is also true that many of our seniors 
uh, kind of cut their adult teeth on, yes. on political action. Yes. And this is not something we get to give away. Uh, but uh, uh, we're going to take another little break here because, Rigo, you brought along mm -hmm. some, uh, some tape for us to see mm -hmm. some of the services so we all know what we're talking about. And Aging in L.A. recently took a tour of the St. Barnabas Senior Services. And Rigo, please be our tour guide as we look inside your community. Absolutely. This is our reception area of our building that we moved into in 1987. These are photographs of our staff who are multilingual and, and uh, multicultural, reflecting the community that we serve. We speak over eight languages, uh, wow. the major languages being uh, Korean, Spanish, uh, Cantonese, Mandarin, Vietnamese, uh, and uh, very uh, dedicated uh, staff. This is our atrium area. We like to sort of give a home feel to our center. So as people walk in, they, as you can see, there's magazines and areas and sofas where folks can lounge around and uh, so that uh, it's a home away from home. And also there's opportunities for our home theater. We show movies every three days um, or three times a week. In addition, this is the cyber cafe that I was mentioning to you. As you can see, there are uh, tables there set up so that people can uh, uh, engage. This is one of our nutrition sites or at our main building. Uh, as I mentioned, there we have six uh, nutrition sites, so congregate meal sites, and here's one of them at our main building. We uh, serve about uh, about 80 meals a day at that location, mm -hmm. about three over 350 meals uh, per day on all sites combined. Uh, very nutritious meal. Of course, uh, there are standards that we have to meet uh, in, in terms of the uh, daily requirements and so on and so forth. Sure. Um, and uh, this is where we prep our, our meals and you can see we work also with Title V uh, uh, programs and we hire the Title V volunteers to work with our nutrition program. Mm -hmm. Here's the upstairs of our building and this, we use this particular area open space to provide uh, uh, Tai Chi classes, exercise classes, fall prevention class. And uh, these offices that you're looking at here are sort of a reflection obviously of the staff uh, of the, uh, the various cultural backgrounds but uh, they're also there to provide case management, social services, here's the transportation. And here's one of our physicians that uh, leases one of our space that provides uh, medical uh, attention to our clients uh, once a week. And this is a, a shot here of our S. Mark Taper Foundation uh, Adult Day Healthcare Center. And we're very proud of this center. This, was, uh, this building was completed in 2003. Again, uh, we have a very diverse uh, service uh, staff uh, speaking many languages on site again reflective of the population that we serve uh, and here as you can see there's uh, quite a bit of activities there's uh, occupational therapy physical therapy we also have uh, a gardening area in the back uh, as part of the uh, occupational therapy uh, and here's one of our uh, social workers uh, working with one of our clients and here's a quiet room area as well again the whole idea here is to try to set it up so that uh, it's a home away from home that home feeling so that you don't you know the folks there who primarily have a cognitive impairment that we serve in the site uh, you know feel that they are at home right wow that, that's it's really amazing we What's the mix of staff, of paid staff, volunteer staff? Well, uh, I, we have about uh, 43 paid staff, mm -hmm. and uh, we also then have about an additional about 20 uh, volunteers that uh, we have through Title V. And uh, can I assume that. that there are many volunteer opportunities there? Oh, there absolutely are volunteer opportunities. And in mm -hmm. fact, uh, we're, I'm really, again, this is a difficult time to look for additional resources, but we've got to get creative because I'm really right. looking for someone that I can hire on as full time to be able to be a, a volunteer manager. Right. Uh, because I, there is so many seniors out there who really want to give back to the community. And there are so many needs that we have, particularly in these times where you have less to do more. And I think it's a great time to bring volunteers from the community to come in and help and address the needs of the, of the community. You see. Laura, you know, for many years I have said these intergenerational mm -hmm. programs are the ones I favor. The idea that youngsters, mm -hmm. even very young mm -hmm. youngsters, mm -hmm. uh, have a role to play Absolutely. in helping to care for our senior population. Besides the love and wisdom mm -hmm. that they are able to, to acquire, uh, they can do so many things oh, to help an, an elderly relative or even in a volunteer setting. Absolutely, and many of our centers actually have 
uh, placement for um, high school students doing social service hours. Great. Uh, and, and those hours count, right? Absolutely. You see. Yeah, um, yes. Many of them are doing uh, that work at daycares. Uh, others are entire classes, for example. We've been working with elementary schools to write letters for isolated seniors to receive one during the holidays. They uh, write letters or, or make cards, and we deliver them with a meal during uh, the that's Christmas wonderful. holiday. We utilize volunteers, uh, families, entire families who dedicate a part of their Thanksgiving holiday to help us do a home delivered meal uh, for that day. We're very proud. That's an entirely funded uh, and operated by volunteers. That's fantastic. Uh, we also have an incredible volunteer program which is really uh, gaining uh, statewide recognition where we have a high school uh, that works with a senior center, but primarily these are developmentally disabled young adults who help in the nutrition program uh, at our multipurpose center, and so they're gaining uh, work skills, right. but the other part they're getting, and they're gaining also tremendous socialization skills. The seniors loved having these young people, you know, really trying to be of help to them, and it's a, it just is an incredible sight to see. Well, I, one of the things that I'm sure Marie, you'll agree with me, is to end this isolation. These are not pockets of special needs people. These are our moms and our dads and our aunts and our uncles, and we need to include them. But they're part, well, we all grew up with our grandparents around, yes. and so it's very, very comfortable. It's natural, and that's what we need. But I wanted to make a comment on the volunteer <laughs> aspect of involving youth in okay, some quickly, of the settings. Please. Yes, we're, we're up workforce it. development, future yes. physicians, nurses, right. social workers, rehab therapists. That's what we need. I got you. Well, I, I'm, I'm sorry that uh, our time is up for today's edition of Aging in L.A. Important Conversations. Uh, thank you so much to our guest, Laura Trejo, General Manager of the Los Angeles Department of Aging, Dr. Marie Torres, Senior Vice President of Government Relations at Ultimate Health Services, and Rigo Saborio, Executive Director of St. Barnabas' Senior Services. And now, it's time for today's Senior Stat Shots. The U.S. Census Bureau has released data that highlight the staggering boom in the senior citizen population in the nation and the world. In the U.S., the senior citizen population appears to be headed to a 40% increase in the next five years due to the flooding of the senior ranks by baby boomers. The world's 65 and older population is projected to triple by mid-century from 516 million folks in 2009 to 1.5 billion in 2050. In contrast, the world population under 15 is expected to increase by only 6% during the same period, from 1.83 billion to 1.93 billion. At this time, less than 8% of the world's population is 65 and older. But by 2030, the world's population of seniors is expected to reach 12 percent and by 2050 that share is expected to grow to 16 percent and that's today's senior stat shot the los angeles department of aging produces this program with city view channel 35 so that seniors living in los angeles and surrounding communities are well informed on the many issues that face them in everyday life. And also to let you know of the many services that the Department of Aging offers our senior citizens. Now we'd like to hear from you with comments on the program, what you like, what you think can be improved, and your ideas for future programs. Please give us a call. The number's right there on your screen, area code 213-252-4088. That's 213-252-4088. Call us with your comments and ideas. We look forward to hearing from you. I'm Paul Peterson for the Los Angeles Department of Aging, the people here at City View Channel 35, and all of our guests on Aging in L.A. Thank you so much for watching. We'll see you the next time.
Channel 35. Your city, your channel.
I would like to go through the agenda. Yes. All right. Welcome to Los Angeles. Are we, we live yet? Okay, the monitor is not on. Welcome to Los Angeles City Hall. This is the Los Angeles City Council Chambers meeting of the Los Angeles City Council on Friday, June 25th, 2010. And the council meets three times per week. On Tuesdays, Wednesdays, and Fridays, all meetings are open to the public. For those who cannot make it to City Hall, meetings are televised via cable on Channel 35 or can be viewed by visiting our website. Now the meeting is in session. Mr. Clerk, please call the roll. Alicon, Cardenas, Han, Weezer, Kuretz, Kikorian, LaBonge, Parks, Perry, Reyes, Rosendahl, Smith, Weston, Zion, Garcetti. Ten members present and a quorum, Madam President. What is the first item of business? It is approval of the minutes. Uh, Council Member Wesson moves. Council Member Zion seconds. Commendatory Next. resolutions for approval. Councilwoman Han moves. Uh, Council Member Cardenas seconds. Madam I President, first items on the agenda. Items 1 through 15 are item, are. Building and safety liens, notice for public hearing. And the department reports that items 1, 7, 12, 13, and 15 can be received and filed in as much as those liens have been paid. All right, that'll be without objection. Open the roll. Close the roll. Tabulate the vote. Ten eyes. Next item. That does leave the remaining uh, liens to be confirmed, and there are cards on 10 and 11. Right, so that would leave council 2 through 6 and 8 and 9. All right, great. Call that, put that special. Next item. No, that does leave those items, Madam President, so council can vote to confirm those assessments. All right, you want to open the roll on that? Oh, colleagues, do you have any specials? Specials. Specials? All right, no specials. All right, open the roll on the remaining items. Close the roll. Tabulate the vote. Ten eyes. Next item. Items 16 through 25 are items for which public hearings have been held. Item 19 was submitted without recommendation and motion is required from the floor. And on item 24, there's a request to continue that matter to Tuesday, June 29th. All right, that'll open up. Mr. Rosendahl. Uh, item 16, Madam President, um, that is potentially a closed door session I, issue. I, I had my hand up on that one, but that's good. <laughs> well, me too. Uh, okay. I want to talk right, about we'll the libraries and the hours and that's the staff. That's fine. That's fine. Okay. Call it special. Me too. All right. All right. Mr. Zine, you have a special? Yeah, Madam President, I have a request from the city attorney on 24 to continue to July 15th or any day after July 15th. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Zion. I have requested that we continue the item to June the 29th. So, Mr. Clerk, what do we do about that? Uh, if council wants, wishes to make a motion, to I'll make a motion. To I'll, a make a motion I'll make a motion at the request of the city attorney to continue item 24 to July 15th or any date after July 15th, due to the fact that he will uh, not be in town. He needs to be in town to testify on that matter number 24. So it's his personal request that we continue that to July 15th or a date after July 15th at the request of our city attorney. Now, Mr. Clerk or Mr. City Attorney, I would like to make a motion that we continue the matter to June the 29th, which is next week. So do I need to come out of the chair to do that? All right, well, However, Madam President, a uh, second to Mr. Zines is first required. Second. Second on which one? Zines. On Mr. Zines. And then there will be a second. Mr. Zines, Zines, Mr. LeVon seconds Mr. Zines' motion. And do I need a second on my request? And you would need a second on yours I'll as well. Yours too, Thank Jan. you very much. Mr. LeVon seconds Jan Perry's motion to continue the 29th. He is a diplomat and a scholar. Thank you very much, Mr. Zines. Madam, Madam President, do you wish to hold that on the desk to take that up later? Yes, hold that on the desk. Thank you. All right, next, uh, you open the Any specials, any other? Mr. LaBonge. When we hit 17, we want to go forthwith to get it done. Thank you. 17 to go forthwith? Uh, Madam uh, President, can I have 22 forthwith? All right, 22 will go forthwith also. Thank you. Any other specials? Mr. Parks. Yes, I'd like to have uh, 19 special and 25. Okay. Thank you. Any other specials members? All right, let's open the roll on the remaining items. Open the roll, close the roll, tabulate the vote. Ten eyes. Next. 17, 21, and 22 forthwith. All right, 17, 21, and 22 will go forthwith. Um, next item. Items 26 through 38 are items for which public hearings have not been held. Ten votes are required for consideration. Members, any specials? All right, the cards. We have some cards on those items. Yes, Madam President, you have cards on items 26, 31, and 34. All right, those will all be special. 
Uh, any other specials members? All right, nobody's raising their hand. Open the roll on the remaining items. Close the roll. Tabulate the vote. Ten eyes. And the ordinances on 27 and 28 will go over for one week. Ordinances on 27 and 20. I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you. They do go over one week. Okay, great. That uh, that does take care of the special, uh, the regular meeting. Does council wish to go back to presentations at this point? Yes, that'll be fine. Mr. Koretz is our first presentation. Stay here, stay here, see you in the picture. Well, thank you, Madam Chair. We're here for another Feline Friday, where we feature beautiful cats from our shelters uh, who are offered up for adoption. Um, hopefully, you can see these uh, kittens on screen. Uh, I don't see them here yet uh, in City Hall. We know if they're on screen. Are we being televised yet? Are we on TV? Yeah, you yeah, texted yes. Okay, great. Um, this Friday we have a dynamic duo to offer up for adoption, and right now uh, our animal shelters have a, a summer buddies deal, uh, which is two for one cats, two for the price of one, and these these two are both very cute. They're, these kittens' names are Winston and Dewey. Winston's ID number is A111-7567. He's a six-week-old black-and-white kitten, and he's already neutered. And next we have Dewey, and he is also neutered. Both came in together and make a wonderful addition to your family as a team. And if you want to adopt these kittens, you can call my office at 213 Four seven three seven zero zero five. You can call LA Animal Services at eight 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 four five two seven three eight one, or come down to the council chambers and adopt these two gorgeous kittens. And uh, you could also adopt uh, Spencer and Caroline, who are here with the kittens. No, not really. So thank you very much. Uh, and don't forget, uh, any time you want to adopt an animal from any of our six shelters, you can call the, start the process by calling LA Animal Services. And again, that number is 888-452-7381. Thank you so much. And, and uh, come and adopt these cats during the summer also while they have the, their two-for-one deal, and you can always get two beautiful cats. Um, and uh, help us adopt out the cats and save their lives and make them wonderful members of your family. Thank you very much, Mr. Koretz. Now our next um, friend is Mr. Wesson and his new friend. This may be a pet adoption uh, or feline Friday, but it's also pet adoption Friday. And today, in fact, I have from Animal Services, Joe mm -hmm. and the volunteer. Matthew. And the volunteer, Matthew. Matthew, get up here where people can see you, or at least get by Puffy. We have a uh, slightly over a year poodle terrier mix named Puffy 
who is ready to go, has all of her shots and, and just looking for a home. And I just want to take a few minutes to say that we have six shelters with many companion animals in need of a home. And uh, if we can't find homes for them, then they have to be put to sleep. So you're doing more than just adopting a companion animal. You are saving a life, the life of a cat, a life of a dog. Anyway, I was going to give this riveting speech to try to make people want to just run down here and get Puffy, but it's my understanding that Puffy already has an owner uh, that works for Mr. Parks named Kathy, and so I just wanted everybody to, to see how beautiful uh, Puffy is and to know that we have six shelters with hundreds of um, uh, companion animals just like uh, uh, Puffy. So what we're going to do is take Puffy in the back and she will wait for her new mother to come pick her up. Anyway, thank you. Mr. Koretz, did you have a second presentation? Oh, oh, oh. Hundred percent adoption rate for the dogs. One hundred percent. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you. Mr. Koretz has a second presentation. Two Sundays ago, nestled in a beautiful rustic canyon, the residents of Beverly Glen celebrated a golden anniversary, their 50th anniversary of their Glen Fair um, in Beverly Glen. Back in 1960, Chris Holliburd and Sarah Sanchi had a vision, a vision of strangers coming together to celebrate and enjoy life in Los Angeles. The fair opens each year with Chris leading the procession of residents, LAPD and LA Fire Department and city officials playing his bagpipes as he has done for each of the past 50 years. The festivities are loaded with enjoyment for all ages with a program that includes live music, food, wine, kids' activities, two raffles, exhibits, fire trucks, slides, a petting zoo, and special guests, as well as the fine men and women of LAFD and LAPD. I had the fortunate opportunity to attend and honestly, it was one of the most fantastic, friendly, and charming events I've ever had the honor of attending. We have many residents of Beverly Glen with us today. And standing with me are board members, President Tensi Palmer, past president Ramin Kalahi, chair of the fair Elke Heitmeyer, and traffic chair Evelyn uh, Jerome Alexander, among others. And on behalf of the city of Los Angeles, I'd like to present a commendation um, now, the founder of the fair is not here, uh, but uh, I'll read the certificate and present it to, to the whole group, and then whoever wants to speak, uh, we can do that. And it reads, uh, the city of Los Angeles congratulates and celebrates the residents of Beverly Glen and the Beverly Glen community on the momentous occasion of the golden anniversary of the Glen Fair. For 50 years, the Glen Fair has been a wonderful community event that brings the Glen together and fosters the unique charm and character of Beverly Glen. So, I want to recognize all of you and whoever wants to speak on behalf of me. Let's see the picture first. Okay. Hi, Mike. Hi, Mike. Now, whatever. Thanks, sir. Thank you, man. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, City Council. We are very honored. The Residents of Beverly Glen uh, Association was actually founded in 1952 in response to flooding and mudslides that closed the Beverly Glen Boulevard. Since then, the community has always pulled together in times of crisis, mudslides, fires, earthquake. 
We uh, not only uh, come together for a crisis, but we also come together to celebrate our beautiful community. Spring garden walks, holiday parties in December, and we have lectures and musical events in our beautiful uh, community center. And then we have our summer uh, Beverly Glen Fair, the 50th this time. And it was started by, um, I don't know if we can see that, Sarah Sanchi and Chris Holliburd. Uh, Chris Holliburd actually met his wife at the fair. And um, Darby and Greg Heimer, who are with us today, have been around the community, have been active community members almost from day one. <laughs> And uh, I've been around since 1980. Uh, but the vibrancy of the community is really expressed by our younger members. Like R Ramin Kalahi has been, became president of the association within a year of moving into the canyon. And uh, Janine Gershon takes care of our relationship with the community center. And uh, our current president, uh, Tensi Palmer, and her husband are raising their children in the community. And, um, you know, one of the issues we really deal with is the traffic on the boulevard. So if you have to cross the hills, please take the freeway. <laughs> <laughs> But our, our fierce traffic uh, chairperson, Evelyn uh, Jerome Alexander, has really been fighting for the quality of life in the canyon. So we are honored that uh, we have been you know, recognized for our community efforts. And um, Ramin, would you like to say a word? Uh, I just wanted to uh, thank you, Councilman Koretz, for uh, since taking office, he's been day one actively engaged. I was president at the time last year. Uh, in our meetings, in annual meetings, uh, responding to emails, in council chambers against, for some of our concerns, his staff, particularly Jeff and Sean, have been fantastic responding at all of our issues, traffic, zoning, otherwise that you face here every day. And our deep history, I'm not sure you mentioned that we might be one of the oldest, but I want to show some of the historic photos. Uh, this was the big flood of 1952, which caused us to sort of get together. Uh, that crisis creates uh, opportunity, as they say. And this is uh, about 40 some odd years ago, Chris Holliburd, a much younger one, uh, leading the ferry. He always leads it in that bagpipe. And for fun, I was going to show you the kids and the community get together. Uh, we don't do this anymore. It's a little bit dangerous, obviously. Uh, but I'm also the current uh, co-president of the playgroup. So we have three organizations, the residents, the playgroup, which is a preschool, and the community center. And we work very closely together. And having Councilman Koretz on our side, helping us and, and being with us, not, not only here in the council chambers, but spiritually, is invaluable. And a deep gratitude to you for doing that and this special occasion for all the hard-working volunteers and a special thanks to Elki. This was an unbelievable fair, and big thanks to her. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. I'll take a picture in back too. We actually. Uh, we go back and back. We'll leave it there. Yeah. All right, Mr. Rosendahl, you are up next. Lesson in City. It is. I brought my kids. <laughs> oh, did you? Oh, you're a dog. I added one last verse. Okay. All right. Yeah, I see that. Okay. Uh, good morning, colleagues. Uh, I would love to ask uh, Assemblymember Julia Brownlee to come on up, who also represents the Getty in her Assembly District. Let's just welcome the great Assemblymember. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. All right. Uh, we're here to honor the Getty Foundation. Colleagues, uh, they've been around 25 years. Imagine how time flies when you're having a good time. Um, first, before I say anything more about the Getty Foundation, we had an adjourning motion about a week ago for James Woods. Remember? Uh, he suddenly passed away on a Friday. 
He was running uh, the entire Getty complex. Uh, and there's so many things we could say about him. I said it in the adjourning motion, but the part that hit me the most about him was his concern for people, people who worked for him, people who were engaged with him, and just his general lifestyle of being open and positive and a great human being. And we miss him terribly. Obviously, um, we expected him to be here. But we all know that all we have is the moment in this world, and every moment is precious, and unfortunately he was taken away from us just a couple of weeks ago. So let's just talk about the Getty Foundation. We have standing here with me Deborah Morrow, who's the interim president and CEO uh, of the Getty Trust. Where's Deborah? Deborah. Um, we have Ron Hardwick, who's vice president of communications. Ron's been around there a while uh, and has done an incredible job. Unfortunately, he and I talked uh, about the um, adjourning motion uh, for James Wood. Uh, Joan Weinstein, interim director of the Getty Foundation. Right here. There you, there you are. Great. Okay. Um, uh, Angie Kim, who's the principal project specialist at the Getty. Come on over here so you can be seen. Okay. Uh, and Hillary Walter, uh, who is the program assistant. Where's Hillary? Great. Okay, great. Okay. And as I mentioned, uh, my colleague in the State Assembly, Julia Brownlee, is also with me. But you'll also be here for item 34, folks, which is about plastic and the supermarkets and convenience stores. And we look forward to that item uh, when, when we get to that and her leadership on that issue. We obviously all know how the Getty has been helpful in many areas for us, besides visiting the grounds and enjoying its exhibit. The Foundation has projects in Los Angeles and throughout the world, which advance the understanding and preservation of the visual arts. They have given money all over the planet and have been very active in funding art collections, history collections, conservation of issues, leadership, and residential fellowship. Since its inception, the Getty Foundation has awarded grants impacting over 180 countries. Can you imagine that? The Getty Foundation encourages intellectual exchange in art history across national and regional borders by giving support to visiting faculty of art history departments and research centers in the developing world, as well as regional seminars that bring together international groups of scholars for research projects and want to create regional and international networks. So they help all of the art community throughout the planet, encouraging groups to get together supporting groups and funding them. The Getty Foundation funds professional development opportunities for individuals at various stages of their careers, such as multicultural undergraduate and graduate interns, and also provide professional development grants. These grants allow professionals from developing countries to attend international conferences, enhancing their skills and increasing opportunities for connection with colleagues around the world. We thank the Getty Foundation for its extraordinary efforts, its generosity, which helps promote and carry on the importance of art, as well as art history here in the city of Los Angeles and around the world. And we wish them a happy 25th anniversary, especially in this day and age when we see so much energy negatively out there, negativity here, there, everywhere, fights, wars, but art transcends national borders. Art transcends one's particular um, attitude about life. It is a healing, collecting, positive force. And the Getty has been sprinkling that energy throughout the earth. And it's an honor for me, on behalf of the City Council, uh, to honor the Getty Foundation for its extraordinary history to all of us. And we'd like to give it to whomever wants What's to get it. How <laughs> sweet. Why don't you take it and say a few words? OK, thank you. Well, I'll let you know. <laughs> okay. well, thank you very much, Councilman Rosenbaum, to all the City Council for this honor and for your support. Uh, we all wish Jim Wood were here with us, and thank you very much for the adjourning tribute to him last week. Jim believed deeply in the work of all four programs of the Getty Trust, and he loved Los Angeles and was proud of the work that the Getty has done here in our home city. He was very proud of the foundation and of the fact that we have provided over $100 million in grants in Los Angeles and the surrounding area. And that includes signature programs, and I'll just mention one, 
like Pacific Standard Time, Art in Los Angeles, 1945 to 1980, through which more than 50 organizations all across the Los Angeles region will join together and have exhibitions about LA art in the post-World War II decades. This will take place from fall 2011 to spring 2012. That's just one aspect of the Getty's outreach into the community. All of the Getty programs, the Foundation, the Conservation Institute, the Museum, and the Research Institute are active in LA. We have a good partnership with the city, and we look forward to many years of continuing to work together. Thank you again. Thank you very much. Madam President, may I? Yes, Mr. Lamont. Mr. Rosendahl, Madam Assemblywoman, to the Getty Foundation, to all the team. It's truly a remarkable transition that has taken place these last 10 years plus, and a lot has had to do with the Getty Foundation and the Getty itself. Uh, it, many great things have happened. And as you just mentioned, the program for 2011, how you're bringing all of Southern California from San Diego to, Sa to uh, Santa Barbara out to the uh, Coachella Valley and Palm Springs. This is so important. Uh, uh, Jim Wood was a dynamic individual. We don't know when our ticket is punched or our name is called or... I love Warren Beatty and Heaven Can't Wait. He pulled it off and Heaven Can't Wait, but Heaven couldn't wait for Jim because that is, was a tragic loss for all of us. But the Getty Foundation has done remarkable things and the, and the push to the communities, not just the Sunset Boulevard, Grocery Boulevard, you've gone everywhere. Getty has his name on everything in this community. I only hope one day you could have a satellite along the LA River somewhere as we transform the river as you could make it a moving art gallery. But I want to stand with Mr. Rosendahl and congratulate you for what all of you have done. And do know that we have made a transition. Previously, the champion and the super champion was Joel Wax, who was quite the artist, uh, art appreciator. Pardon the mispronunciation. Now, there's so he spread that to other people. They're not going to be as all pro as Joel Wax as it comes to uh, uh, the issue of art. But we all got art in our bloods, and we know how it is important to the community. So I just wanted to really thank the Getty, and also remember Jim, and, uh, and uh, stand with all of you in his loss. And thank you for the past, the present, and the future, what the Getty does. Thank you, Madam President. Mr. Rothenau, thank you all. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Rosendahl. Our next presentation is Mr. Huizar, Council District 14. Well, thank you very much, Madam President and colleagues and public. Um, today, it gives me great pleasure to recognize in council an extraordinary person who also happens to be the principal of Knowledge is Power Preparatory, or KIPP LA, as is known in Ball Heights. I want to recognize today an individual who recently was awarded a very special recognition, and I'm talking about Miss Angela Martinez. And welcome to these chambers. I just saw Ms. Martinez at the KIPP LA graduation in, in Boyle Heights, uh, where we congratulated an eighth grade class that is going to go on to high school and off to college, because after all, KIPP LA focuses on preparing young people uh, for college, irrespective of their background, of their income level, and their race, and they are doing a tremendous job. I first uh, was engaged with KIPP LA when I was on the Board of Education and I went to their Lincoln Heights campus and was so impressed when I walked in and saw young people focusing and talking about where they will go to college and what is it they need to do to get there. Uh, when I think of KIPP LA, I think that they are focusing on one of the most pressing issues that this country is faced with, and that is how do we close the academic achievement cap 
so that we ensure that we have all people, all young people, uh, prepared to lead this country in the future. Uh, now let me tell you a little bit about Ms. Martinez. Uh, prior to working with KIPP Foundation, Ms. Martinez taught at Ralph Bunchy Elementary School in Compton for six years. At Bunchy, she held, am I pronouncing that right? Bunch. Bunch, thank you very much. At Bunch, she held a variety of leadership positions, including grade level chair and teacher representative to the school site council. She also served as a leadership team member, and in this capacity, she wrote winning applications for the California Distinguished School Award for 0506 and the Title I Academic Achievement Award for 04, 05, and 06. Most recently, Ms. Martinez, and one of the reasons we wanted to come here to recognize, here, recognize her with a city recognition is that she is the recipient of the Leaders Council's 40 Under 40 Award, which aims to celebrate leadership and entrepreneurship, advocacy, media, and politics. The 40 Under 40 Award is extremely prestigious, and there is, without a doubt, no one more deserving than Angela Martinez. So, Ms. Martinez, it's my great pleasure to present to you uh, this recognition on behalf of the City of Los Angeles congratulating you and thanking you for the work you do on behalf of our children and for your recent award and we encourage you and hope that you will conti continue doing more of the same. Thank Congratulations. You. Thank you very much. Wow. Wow. So you may want to take a photo and then come up and say okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, first, I want to thank Councilman Quasar for uh, acknowledging KIPP LA and the achievements of our students and our families. Um, KIPP Los Angeles College Preparatory School is the seventh highest performing middle school in LAUSD. We are the highest performing middle school serving students of uh, color and predominantly students um, who receive Title I services. Uh, it is an, an honor to serve the students of Boyle Heights. I look forward to ensuring that our children receive a world-class education so that they are competitive in a ever-changing world. Our program ensures that our students starting in kindergarten with our elementary school that is in East Los Angeles, that they are prepared to succeed to and through college. Not just getting there, but finishing college. So thank you again to everyone and the councilmen for your support. We look forward to continued partnership. Thank you very much. And introduce uh, your friends right here. So here we, uh, at KIPP, we, we have, we call our team and family, truly team and family. I have here with me to support Ms. Marsha Aaron, who is our executive director for KIPP LA. I have Alma Sibrian, she is our Director of Real Estate, which can be a challenge here in Los Angeles. Thank you, Alma. <laughs> also here I have um, our team member on our academic team, Eric DeSoe. And I have here another KIPP LA team member, Christina Zaldana. So thank you again. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. And KIPP LA and Ms. Martinez and the whole team is showing that all students can achieve to their highest potential if we give them that opportunity to succeed. It's about showing them and expecting high expectations from all students and giving them the resources to succeed. And in Ball Heights, where I grew up, uh, it's my pleasure to know and to see that there's a lot of young people there that believe in themselves and are going to go on to do great things because of the work that all of you do. Congratulations once again. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Huizar. Uh, Madam Clerk, two items I'd like to take care of, and then we're going to take item 34 out of uh, order. Uh, first, I would like to ask for reconsideration on item number 38. Can you open the roll on that? Close the roll. Tabulate the vote. Ten eyes. And then call that item special, please. All right, and then the next item I would like to take out of order uh, before we go to 34 is item 24. Um, and if I am able, Mr. City Attorney, Mr. Clerk, to comment from the chair. Uh, 
And Madam President, there were competing motions on that, and the last motion made is usually the first motion voted on, and that was the Perry LaBonge motion to continue that matter to June 29th. All right, members, I had asked to continue this item to June 29th, and I think that it should be noted that July 6th is the deadline for the California State Assembly to get this bill out of the policy committee, and I think it's extremely important in terms of representing the city, regardless of your position on SB 1168, to ensure that the city takes a position on this one way or the other before the state legislature acts effective July the 6th. If we go to three weeks, we will eliminate our options to put a city position on the record and we then give up our power to weigh in on this issue. And again, regardless of your position, uh, I do believe that it is important as Los Angeles City Council members to let the California State Legislature know the city's position. This item has already gone to Mr. Cardenas's committee, um, I believe earlier this week, if I'm correct, Mr. Cardenas, um, and uh, that is uh, ITGS, and a vote was taken in that committee, and it is a matter of public record, but the committee action is not dispositive of what the position of the entire City Council would be. And so again, I emphasize the state legislature cut off is July the 6th. It is the deadline to get all their matters out of their policy committee. And so because of the holiday, I think it's extremely important that the city of Los Angeles at the very least take a position on SB 1168 prior to the July 6th deadline, the California State Legislature, and let the legislature know what our city position is on this bill. And I ask to continue this item to June the 29th. And I expect that at that time our chief administrative office will have a complete analysis and, and budget analysis, fiscal impact analysis for us to review and consider so that you can make an informed decision uh, based on the merits of this bill and we can talk about process more fully. Um, so I ask for an aye vote on my motion. Um, Mr. Clerk, should we vote on that first or let Mr. Zine go first? Mr. Zine. Uh, Madam President, I'd like to uh, hold this on the table. The city attorney's office is sending a uh, representative to testify on this matter uh, on the competing amendments uh, that have been brought forward, or competing motions, I should say. Uh, I think out of due respect to the city attorney who uh, had this passed in the state senate and it is proceeding to the assembly, out of respect to the city attorney, I think it would be appropriate to hear from their office and why they want to continue, why they're not available on the date that you have uh, scheduled to have this continued. We're not taking the vote today. It's being continued at your request, Madam President, and I don't oppose that. But the fact is I think we should hear from the city attorney's office that are making the request. And out of courtesy, I think we should do that before we take a position on this All right, matter. Mr. Zine, just as a slight correction, it is not headed towards the Assembly. It is being held in the Public Safety Committee at the State Assembly. Uh, and that was uh, indicated by the Chair of the, the Assembly. And we can have the Chief Legislative Analyst come to the table and put that on the record so that everybody knows what we're talking about. And we're all working from the same set of facts. Uh, if you give me a time that the individual from the City Attorney's Office will be able to come down and speak on this, I'm more than happy to hold it for today. And it also, also should be noted that if neither motion passes, then the matter is before us today, and then we can take a vote on it today. Um, uh, they, they just arrived, um, okay, great. Mr. Carter and Mr. Sorry, we can take it up right now, then. If we can have Mr. Mr. Miller, you might as well stay there, too. Okay. If Mr. Carter and Mr. Echeverria can please come to the table on this matter along with Mr. Miller. And just to um, inform our two representatives from the city attorney's office on this matter, the uh, continuation on this matter, uh, our president, Madam Perry, is requesting this be continued to the 29th. I'm uh, requesting it be continued to July 15th or a date after uh, at the request of the city attorney. And the two competing motions are now where the date it's going to be continued. So if you can respond as to why it needs to be continued past the 29th and the information for this particular council. We understand it's been approved by the, the Senate 
and it's now at assembly a committee. Uh, but the particulars are the discussion now is regarding the date of continuance on this body. Uh, good morning, uh, Madam Chairman, other members of the council. William Carter, uh, City Attorney's Office, forgive my voice. The, uh, neither myself nor the City Attorney will be available on June 29th. Uh, the City Attorney, who also would like to be here for the hearing, will, will be out of the country, actually, on July 6th. So he has asked me and to ask you respectfully if he can have this hearing the week after June or July 6th. The city attorney would like to be present for those hearings on this matter, which is a very important matter for the city attorney. So we respectfully ask that it be continued past the 29th and then past July 6th to a date the following week of July 6th. Mr. Cardenas. Yes. Uh, question to Mr. Carter. Um, it's on the file today, but it appears that there's plenty of reasons why we would want to put it over. However, are you stating that the city attorney himself would like to be present, yet he is not in Los Angeles between now until the week after July 6th? He is, he is in Los Angeles today. He will not be in Los Angeles on the tw June 29th, and he is taking a vacation with his wife. He will be out the week of July 6th, returning the following week. Now, how about, um, when, when, the, when are the next scheduled meetings of the council? There is the 29th, then the 30th, and then Friday, July 2nd. Okay, is he in town, is the city attorney in town on the 30th? He, 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 I believe he is, but I don't know that for a fact. Okay. I know he is not on the 29th. But, but the deadline, what is the deadline again for the matter uh, to the CLA? What is the deadline for this matter to be uh, um, heard in the policy committees? Yeah, 29th. In the legislature? 29th. The, the, the deadline in policy committees is July 2nd. Yeah, July 2nd. Oh. See, so if we were able to accommodate Mr. Zine's request, the city attorney's request, and also so, Ms. Perry's request, it sounds like policy. June 30th, if in fact, policy. if in fact, the city attorney, the city attorney, elected city attorney Carmen Tutanich is in town on the 30th. Perhaps we should give you an opportunity to confirm with him if he's available on the 30th, because your request of putting it over till after the week of July 6th puts us beyond the July 2nd date. And as was stated by uh, Councilmember Perry, whose motion this is, she would like this matter to be heard by by this body of which she's a member of so that we can decide as a body whether or not we are going to weigh in with a support, with a, an opposed, or perhaps we go with a neutral position or something. Uh, th those seem to be the options of this body. And so I think it would be imperative that you find out if Mr. Tutanich can be here on the 30th uh, so that the July 2nd date can be appreciated by, uh, by the fact. That, and, and also, ladies and gentlemen, this matter is a matter it's a specific bill that only pertains to the city of Los Angeles. Uh, so this is the kind of bill that actually this body should be paying attention to. Again, whether or not we support it or not is, is, is another story. But this is a matter that we should be paying attention to because it only addresses the issue of the ability of the city attorney of Los Angeles. No other city attorney in the, city of, in the state of California. If I may respond, I would, uh, I'll make an executive decision here. I would, um, I know that I will be in the city on the 30th. I would suspect that Mr. Tutanich will as well. So I think the 30th would, would accommodate that our request. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Cardenas. Mr. Rosendahl. I was just wondering, um, could we have a discussion today and vote today and have a healthy discussion? And if, if the city attorney could come down and talk about it today, I'm ready to vote. Well, Mr. Today. Rosendahl, as chair, there's five members out today. I'd rather have more people here. Well, Mr. Fairness. Corian will not be here next week, and I think he's a smart guy, too, and a lawyer. So the, the sixth is an issue for, for getting the council together. Uh, and, uh, and so, uh, you know, if we want to deal with it, deal with it today. Let's hear from all the other members. Ms. Perry, please. Uh, 
The date that I asked for is June the 29th, of, and thank you, Mr. Cardenas, uh, and June the 29th because it's before the cutoff in the State Assembly. So what I'm attempting to do is to get us to make a decision on the record as a legislative body uh, so that we could just communicate to the State Legislature whatever our position is. Yes. Um, when is the policy committee, uh, is this item agendized in the legislature on what date in the policy okay. committee? Okay. okay. June 29th. Oh, you know what that is? No, no, all right, that's fine. June 29th. Yeah, okay. Tuesday. Tuesday. What, what time is that committee convening? Nine o'clock. Nine o'clock in the morning, which is before we meet for council. So right. just want to make you aware of that. Okay. Although, although the legislature, a point of clarification if you wouldn't mind, the legislature can in fact hear this item any time between July 2nd. They right. can call a hearing, unlike we have the Brown Act and, and the timelines, they can do it uh, much quicker. They can actually call a hearing within minutes. So the fact of the matter is this is an important matter, and I can imagine that if there's a request by the City of Los Angeles, especially with the Speaker of that House being from Los Angeles, we could probably uh, request that they have a hearing subsequent to our Council meeting on the 30th, Okay. specifically on this item. Right. That's fine. You know, my only goal is to make sure that we act before the legislature closes the door. Uh, and Mr. Miller, you said it was July 2nd? Well, the, the policy committee deadline is July 2nd. It then has to go to appropriations. Um, so the final... July 6th. Okay. All right. Well, I would like to just act before it moves forward so that we have a position. There's a lot of confusion in Sacramento uh, about what the city's position is. And uh, I got a call from a reporter from the Los Angeles Daily Journal yesterday who said that uh, she'd been told that I hadn't taken a position on it. And I explained to her that it had been in Mr. Uh, Cardenas' committee uh, earlier this week and that we had actually voted on it and that I had taken a formal position, which was to support my motion to oppose a SB 11. 68 and that it went out of the committee with a two to one vote so that there had been a formal position already documented on the record. Uh, so I, uh, miss, I will make sure that I'm correct in amending my motion or accept your friendly amendment to go to June 30th as opposed to June 29th and uh, ask to uh, vote on my motion first since I came in last. Thank you very much. Ms. Hahn, please. Thank you. Um, I, I certainly don't um, if the city attorney, Mr. Tritanich, is in the building today, if he wanted to come and speak to us today. But I'm uncomfortable voting on this because I think part of what we're doing is asking back for a financial analysis on what this would actually cost the city if, in fact, um, it was implemented. So I don't believe we have that today. Is that correct? What's the status of, of the, the request for a financial analysis of this? The, the CAO was asked to perform that analysis. It right. isn't complete yet, but they said will that they be, will be Will it be next complete week. by the 29th? Yes. Yeah. That's the only reason I, I think we, we ought to hold this off till the 29th is so we can look at the financial implications of this bill. Thank you very much, Ms. Hahn, for your comments, as eloquent as they always are. Mr. Zine? Thank you. The, uh, the matter was discussed, as stated, in committee. I voted to support this. The question regarding funding was addressed by the city attorney's office that the funding would be provided by the city attorney out of their existing budget. There would be no additional request on funding. And my question is, it was continued to today, and Mr. City Attorney is in his office today pending the request from Ms. Hahn regarding the funding were there any other outstanding issues that would prevent us from listening to the city attorney and making a decision on this today? It was a two to one vote in committee, but the fact of the matter is, while time is of the essence, it was continued to today, our city attorney is here today, and now it's being continued to another date. Why can't we, Mr. Miller, get the information today and have this matter heard today so we can make sure we comply with all the time frames? What's the issue with that? The CAO is attempting to get independent confirmation from the county superior courts on what the cost of the grand jury would be. Um, they don't have that ready yet. They, it, it, they will have it ready by next week. And that's the, re that's the reason why we're waiting to get the information from the county? The, the, the outstanding instruction from committee, I believe, in the first meeting was for the CAO to prepare a cost analysis, and, uh, and that's still outstanding. And the city attorney did testify to the fact, the representative testified to the fact, that they would pay all costs out of their existing budget for this particular matter. They did. Were that? Yes, they did. 
Okay. Well, I just want to make sure out of courtesy to the city attorney whether you agree or disagree with his position on this, that we give him the courtesy that we all expect the courtesy to be granted to us, that he'd be able to have the hearing here and we could take the vote whichever way you choose to vote. I think it's appropriate that we permit the city attorney to hear, uh, to have his matter heard. And I know there's some dissension on the council regarding that particular position of the city attorney, but I think in fairness, uh, it would not be appropriate not to permit him or his representative to plead their case, as they say, on this particular matter. Uh, if I may, um, I'm prepared today to discuss the matter in full, all issues, substantive issues, process issues, budgetary issues. We have done the analysis. We've provided to, to the CAO. This is information that we obtained from the county superior court. We've done our analysis. We know how much the grand jury costs per day. Uh, the city attorney is out of the office physically right now. I could track him down and have him get here as soon as possible. I was prepared to go today. Last night at about four in the afternoon, I was advised that this matter was going to be continued. It was not confirmed until about five o'clock that this matter was going to be continued from today. I am prepared and we have other people prepared to have a discussion today. If that's what the council chooses to do, I am prepared to speak on all matters relating to this issue. Thank you, Mr. Carter. So I, I would, in closing with that, I would then make a motion that the representative of the special assistant city attorney is here to testify and make a motion that we hear the matter today with the facts that are going to be presented to us. Again, the matter was heard in committee. All the details were brought up in committee. I make a motion that we hear it today based upon the information of Mr. Carter. And I'll second that motion. Much, Mr. Zion, Mr. Rosenthal, Mr. Parks of the Great Eighth District. If we're gonna if we're gonna hear the item today, I'll wait till they make their comments and I'll speak. Thank you, Mr. Parks. Mr. Weizar. Yes, I. Uh, we've been in situations where we're waiting for cost analysis, and quite frankly, I believe we make a lot of decisions for very little cost analysis. Uh, but I think we have some information. <laughs> Sometimes. <laughs> I believe we have sufficient information today um, to move forward and discuss this today. Uh, we have heard some numbers out there, I believe. I read some numbers about what has been estimated to be the cost. Uh, they vary, but we have a general ballpark, so I would suggest we just hear this today and, and move forward. Thank you, Ms. Perry. I, I do have a comment. I do have a comment. Uh, <laughs> thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, let me just say a few things. I wanted to continue this item to now the 30th in concurrence with Mr. Cardenas because I wanted the CAO to have complete information so that you could be fully informed on all the ramifications of this bill. The cost implications, the fiscal implications, the, the privacy issues, all those things so that you could have it all at once. Now, if we as a body today decide that we don't need that information and, you know, if you want to go for it, then go for it, uh, you know, I'm ready to do that too. I think it's really a stupid decision to make, but if you choose to go ahead and make it because four people are out today and you may think you have enough votes to, uh, uh, five people are out today, uh, you may feel that you have enough votes to get through this, uh, then, you know, it's on you. I mean, you already know where I am and you know what I'm going to say and I'm going to say it again and I'm going to put it on the record. So I'm not really concerned about um, some machination to try to skew things one way or the other. I really wanted to give everybody the same information so that they can make a decision based on the information from the CAO, from the CLA, and from other outside entities like the California District Attorneys Association, uh, Erwin Chereminsky and his experience on the Charter Commission and redrafting the Charter and have all those things for you. But if you decide you don't really want the information on the financial implications of this so that you can make a more uh, well-informed decision, then that, that certainly is your decision to do that. Uh, I think it makes us look rather ignorant as a body. But, you know, again, your decision, I know how I'm voting. Thank you very much. Mr. Wesson. Uh, thank you. Uh uh, Mr. Uh, President and members, I listen to, to Mr. Weezar, and, 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 and you're right. From time to time, we act when we don't have all of the data. But it makes sense 
to me that we begin to change that practice and that when we make of or cast a vote that we have the information, all of the information available to us. Now I'm prepared to discuss and vote on this today, but I think as a matter of how this body should operate, that we should wait until the individuals that work for us, CAL, CLA, provide us with all of the information. So I, I'm, I'm not going to use the colorful metaphors that Ms. Perry did, but I would suggest that we wait until we have all of the data. People watch what we do. And when you have all of the data, I think it eliminates questions. And it just, this to me seems like the common, common sense approach. And, and I have the highest respect for Mr. Carter and the, the, the city attorney, but I do have a little more respect for this council. And if Mr. Weezar is right, and we have been deviating, then we need to get back on course and stay uh, in the center. So I would uh, suggest that we go forward with the suggestion by, from our colleague from the great ninth district. Thank you, Mr. West. Mr. Parks. Uh, thank you, Mr. Uh, President. Colleagues, I would just like to bring up the, the narrow point of the finances. I think it is important to wait because I think what you have to evaluate, this department is going to end up in June 30th, uh, roughly about a $3 million deficit. Uh, also, next year, we purposely, as a body, cut back on the litigation account, which is not a viable source to be looking for for a new program. And this department will also suffer uh, furloughs like every other department. So I don't think you can make a promise of a new program that's unknown dollar value based on these circumstances. And as we know, come October, if revenue isn't where we think it is, then every department will go through another process of reducing programming. So I don't think we can just take that off the cuff and say, let's just take it out of the existing budget because it doesn't exist. Thank you very much. Just a quick procedure question. Procedural question. Um, if we were to vote today and the action was not to support Ms. Perry's motion, does it carry over anyhow for an affirmative vote? And therefore, if that's the case, then we should continue the whole item to the 30th. I just want to know for the record. All right, then we'll get the record right there. Mr. Clerk. So far, the last motion made by Mr. Zine would to be here to matter today. If it yes. didn't receive eight votes, then the next motion is before council. And that is Ms. Perry's motion to continue the matter to June 30th. If that does not receive seven votes, then the final motion is by Mr. Zine to continue to July 13th or a date thereafter. If that does not pass as well, then the matter is back before council once again. Back before right now, today, this hour. Correct. Today. Thank you very much, Clerk. Mr. Cardenas. Call for the question. Is anyone opposed to calling for the question? No, but that's what's before us. We're going to ask the clerk right now. Thank well, you. the question has been called. So the three motions that I identified are before council. But the question has been called. The question has been called. So the first motion will be that of Mr. Zion's last motion. Well, the first, the first vote is on calling the question and ending debate. And that is a 10-vote item. 10-vote item. So Mr. Clerk, open the roll. Close the roll. Tabulate the vote. Eight ayes, two no's. That does not carry, so the debate goes on. The debate goes on. There's uh, Mr. Rosendahl. Mr. Rosendahl. Uh, before I say uh, more clarity from you about if uh, the first motion before us is what? The first motion before council on voting practices would be the Zion Rosendahl motion, which is to hear the matter today. Okay. And assuming we hear it today and we take a vote on it, then what does that mean? If the vote is not an affirmative, affirmative eight votes, then the matter would carry over pursuant to the rules to the next council meeting, which would be Tuesday, June 29th. And Ms. Perry made an amendment that the 30th would work, correct? Ms. Perry's motion was to continue the matter to June 30th. She originally made the 29th, but then she corrected it to say June 30th. Okay. All right. I'm helpful on that. I'm more than happy to move it to the 30th because that gives everybody a chance to do whatever they need to do. 
which is what I'm hearing. Very good, Mr. Rosen. No, that's what you're hearing. That's fine. Ms. Perry. Um, just to simplify matters, then I would like to make a motion to clarify that I am in concurrence with Mr. Cardenas that we should continue this matter to June the 30th, and that would be the last motion in. Yeah, and so, second. therefore, Mr. No, Mr. Chair, if we could vote on my motion first. All right, Mr. Clerk. Is there a second to that motion now? Yes, the second with Mr. Parks. Thanks. And Mr. Cardenas. <laughs> so that's the last motion in. Could this matter be continued to the 30th of June 2010. Comment. Yeah. I'll push a button, Mr. Weizar. Motion, the last motion that was made. You got to push a button first. Point of order. Mr. Weizar. Thank you very much. What's the uh, motion on the table? The, the last motion that was made by Ms. Perry. Yes. I have a motion to clarify that I am in concurrence with Mr. Cardenas to continue this matter until June the 30th, making mine the last motion and therefore the first motion to be voted on. Uh, and I, I'm saying that because I want to be absolutely clear about what I'm trying to do here today so that we can just basically either vote it up or vote it down on June the 30th. But there was a motion made similar to that earlier, correct, Mr. Secretary? Yes, that's why I added additional language into it. And while substantively you could argue that it is similar or the same, I added some additional words into it so that it could be considered as a new motion. Mr. So City Attorney, um, Mr. City, City Attorney, Attorney is on the telephone. Mr. City phone? Attorney, put he's him checking, on hold. Uh, he's calling Robert from Robert Rules of Order. Or, uh, I just want to be procedurally correct. Um, there was a motion made to continue this to the 30th. There was a subsequent motion made to debate this today. Now there is another motion by Ms. Perry that's going to continue it to the 30th with a slight change. My question is, isn't it the same motion as the first one, so therefore it's not valid? Who's on first? <laughs> um, it, it's up to the council chair as I rule to, as this as to whether, as to whether it's, a, it's a new motion or not. Uh, so I rule Zine, Ms. Perry is the last motion. Got you. Mr. Zine, I would suggest you make your same motion, but change it just a little bit. And yours would be the well, last motion. Hold on one. just a second. Let's not keep making motions. If there's, no objections, if there's no objections by the council, I see fit with the members that we have here today to move this to the 30th. Is there any uh, objection a to a that? Point of clarification. Point of clarification. From Mr. Carter. I will withdraw my motion with the uh, cooperation of the city attorney that they will be happy with the 30th for the hearing here. If you're satisfied with that, I will withdraw my motion. Well, we, uh, we defer to the council on its decision, but we would be uh, available. Um, the on work for I, us. I'm being told that the city attorney cannot be here on the 30th, according to Mr. Uh, uh, Connell. But uh, the 30th, if it's acceptable to the council, we will be prepared. To You'll be prepared. Forward. And Mr. Miller, the documents that we're waiting for will be here by the 30th, so we'll have the entire package on the 30th. Is that correct? The CAO has stated that they will have the report ready for next week. Okay. Mr. Carter, will you be prepared to represent the city attorney on the 30th? I will. And, and for a point of, uh, to clarify the record, uh, in terms of our budget deficit as June 30th, the, uh, the CLA and the CAO have indicated and set forth in the final FSR that at maximum our deficit will be $444,000, not $3.3 million. It's $444,000. We reduced our $18.1 million deficit to $400,000, and therefore we also anticipate that we perhaps will have a surplus of $200,000 because we have $600,000 of revenue coming into the city attorney's office. Mr. Okay, I, 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 I don't know if that's the subject before us right now. Mr. 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 LeBron, thank you. I, I have the floor on my matter, no, so I'm going to withdraw my motion. I'm withdrawing my motion regarding the continuation, and I will support the continuation to the 30th so we can vote on that. Hopefully that will be the last motion that we have. Okay. Thank you. If without objection, members, if there's no objection, this matter is continued to the 30th of June. Mr. Parks? I, I just want the public not to be misled. Uh, there was not a $300,000 deficit. It was $2.4 million. And we've told Mr. Carter and the entire city attorney's office, you cannot take a settlement or another form of money to bring into your budget and 
declare that as closing your budget gap. So we took 2.4 million that dealt with a specific legislative issue and we rolled 2.4 million out of the budget in general fund. So the closing deficit for the city attorney's office leaves no, nothing to your imagination is over three million dollars. No matter how he says it, no matter how he brings it to you, it's three million dollars. That's Mr. all I have to Parks, say Thank that. you very much. My last act, Mr. Clerk, strike that. What Mr. Carter said from the record, proceed. <laughs> Without objection, this item goes to June 30th. Thank you very much. Next item, please. Uh, item 34 for Mr. Rosendahl to be taken out of order. Yes. Uh, with Ms. Mr. Cardness and Mr. Rosendahl. Thank you. You are prepared. Uh, Mr. Rosendahl is out of seat. So why don't we start with Mr. Cardenas? Thank you. Uh, Assemblymember Brownlee is, is present uh, to make a presentation on her bill, AB 1998. And uh, Madam President, if we could afford her the opportunity to make a presentation without the limit of the two minutes. Yes. Okay, thank you very much. Assemblymember Brownlee, please. Thank you, Madam President, and thank you for allowing me the opportunity to speak with you about AB 1998. I want to thank Councilmember Smith and Councilmember Cardenas for bringing the resolution of support before you, and I'd like to thank the entire Council for your deliberation and consideration today. No doubt you are keenly aware of the rising costs associated with cities, counties, and the state on general litter abatement. The state estimates these costs collectively at $1.3 billion each year. Tax dollars that are subsidizing the cost of waste and could otherwise be redirected to pay for much needed public services, particularly as we face so many challenges in these hard economic times. AB 1998 will effectively deter the use of single-use bags by prohibiting grocery stores, large retail pharmacies, convenience stores, and liquor stores from providing all single-use carry-out bags beginning in 2012 and 2013, respectively. This will give our constituents who are not already using their reusable bags plenty of time to prepare and get rid of their bag, their bad plastic bag habit. Uh, in lieu of single-use bags, stores will be required to make reusable bags available and will be permitted to give them away. Stores will also be required to provide bags that are only made of 40% post-consumer recycled material and that are compostable at a cost of no less than five cents. This requirement is in the bill to satisfy customers who may not have their reusable bags or enough reusable bags with them at the time of purchase. Let me address the two requests set forth in the resolution before you. The preemption in this bill only includes the bags defined as well as what we commonly know as the vegetable or meat bags in the grocery stores, the pharmacy paper bags that you put your medications in, and the like. It does not preempt local governments from creating their own ordinances around bags in retail stores, restaurants, dry cleaners, or any other industries. We will continue to look at the in-store bag collection that was established by AB 2449 by Assemblymember Levine, but we do believe that if a ban is the law in California, then recycling of them is not necessary. We also know that in the in the store recycling program, it has not been the success we had hoped for with less than 5% of the plastic bags being recycled. 
AB 1998 has a historic coalition of support that includes the environmental community, the grocers, labor, a growing list of cities, counties, and business organizations. Just yesterday, the Orange County Business Council added their support, and a few weeks ago, the California Chamber and the Cal Tax Association removed their op opposition. More and more editorial boards across the state are supporting uh, this bill with the LA Times uh, just yesterday. The momentum continues to grow, but we still need to see the bill through the Senate and get it on the governor's desk. Texas and Arizona are now considering bans, and China, India, and even Bangladesh also have banned plastic bags. I want to thank all of you for your extraordinary environmental leadership. The city of Los Angeles is one of the leading cities in the world in the steps you have taken uh, to green this city. Your support on this measure will help to ensure our success in the legislature and to make California the first state in the nation to ban single-use bags. Thank you for your consideration. Mr. Cardenas. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, uh, Assemblymember Brownlee, for um, speaking to the two requests in the, um, in the resolution that's before us. And the first one had to do with the limit of local preemption to only those bags specifically banned by the bill. So based on your comments, what, what, is, what is your response so to that? It, 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 the, the preemption, it covers what's the, bills, the bags that are defined in the bill. And then it has a clause that says other bags, which is not defined in the bill, but in all of our negotiations, we have talked about the vegetable and meat bag, the small plastic bag that we put our vegetables and meats in, and also this paper pharmacy bag where we would put medications in. Um, and the small, very small plastic bag when you're checking out that if you bought a greeting card, you might put the greeting card in mm -hmm. to separate but that's generally, you know, those things that are in grocery stores now. So as you being the author of the bill, you're, you're explaining to us that the proper interpretation of those bags is what? What is the effect of this bill on those bags? Just in simpler English. Well, it's preempted, which is to say that uh, other cities and counties couldn't have ordinance around, ordinances around those particular uh, uses within the grocery stores. And, and based on your bill, the way it's written uh, today, or, and your intent of any minor adjustments as we speak today, is that those other bags that you just described, for example, the in-store bag, the pharmacy bag, those are allowed to still be in use? Correct. Correct. Okay. So that, that, yes. That's what I wanted to make yes. clear. Yes. Correct. So, okay. Thank but, you. But what I wanted to put, make clear on the preemption is it doesn't preempt uh, other retail stores, uh, restaurants, and other kinds of things. So, you know, cities are okay. free to do ordinances around those issues, and I would okay. encourage it. <laughs> so, so basically, by and large, um, uh, granted any technical interpretations, the, the request in this motion, number one, as I described it, and you just spoke to, basically it does concur with our request, the bill. Okay, yes. now the second request is uh, to con um, when it comes to referring to AB 2449, um, can you clarify for us whether or not that's consistent, the bill as it is today is consistent or not with request number It is not consistent. Uh, right now, the, the current bill states that uh, that um, the in-store recycling would sunset in 2011, and the, if this bill became law, it would not become law until 2012. So there, there would be a one-year uh, a gap. And the reason for that, quite frankly, there's been a, uh, you know, putting this together and, and, and holding on to this coalition that we have, uh, one of the issues was because bills that cost money these days in the legislature don't see the light of day, and so Cal Recycle had to move some of their uh, people power off of this particular program and move it uh, uh, to, to the ban on, on single-use bags, and that's the reason for that. And again, my response is that we, we don't believe that that particular program has been that successful, but I do understand uh, the concern around that issue.
Yes, uh, because what be, you came before the League of Cities, thank you very much, and one of the League of Cities members talked about whatever the law is, she enjoys the fact that she can take bags from her community, from her home, and actually take them to the supermarket and recycle them that way. Uh, that is something that when I was talking to the author who's not here today, Greg Smith, uh, that perhaps you could consider perhaps some type of language that would phase those out over a little bit longer period of time so that those community members who actually utilize it, perhaps above and beyond the call of duty of most Californians, would actually have an opportunity to figure out other means in a little bit longer time for them to to dispose of, of that waste because I'm sure that's your objective and mine. Absolutely. If somebody's going to be that diligent, we would love to afford them, hopefully, the opportunity to continue those good habits. And I, I will make that consideration. I, obviously and I, know, I know it's easier said than done because yeah. every time you m move the language, it could be misinterpreted and open up a door that, that, that none of us intended to. And open. thank you for making that clarification. Okay. Thank you, Madam President, for your generosity of time affording the Assembly Member enough time to explain the bill to the Council of Los Angeles. And thank you, Assembly Member, for, for your time and your diligence and for your bill. Thank, thank you. you, Council. Thank you, Mr. Cardenas. Mr. Rosendahl. Yes, uh, thank you very much, uh, Madam President. Uh, this is long time in coming. You know, it, my, my colleague on my right, Ed Reyes, my colleague on my uh, left, uh, Greg Smith, and I have been talking about this for years, uh, frankly, because um, there's been a tremendous pressure to go forward in the right direction. We, in fact, had a motion, colleagues, that said that if they didn't get their act together in Sacramento by 2010, we were going to impose it here ourselves. So we're very happy to see you in the assembly and your leadership in the assembly. A couple of quick questions. I go to Vaughn's, I go to Ralph's, I go to Whole Foods, okay? The Whole Foods people have no plastic bags. Either you bring in your bags, which I do, and now I've reached the point where I have eight or nine in each of, you know, my vehicle, my personal vehicle, so I don't run out of them. Um, or you can have a paper bag. Will there be that option for Vaughn's and, and uh, Ralph's uh, to um, have paper bags? Or those cloth bags? Is, is yes, that the, the cloth bags obviously will be available, and the bill permits grocers to hand them out if they so choose. Um, the also, which what will be available is a paper bag, but the paper bag will be will constitute 40 percent post-consumer recycled material and be compostable. Great. And I'm pretty sure that's what Whole Foods provides right now. Yes. But it will only be that kind of paper bag. It will not be a paper bag made from recycled material, which is different from post-consumer recycled material. Right. And it will not be a bag made from virgin, from, from virgin paper mm -hmm. as well. Now, now both Ralph's and, and Vaughn's give me credit when I come in with my bag. So give me credit for that uh, on my bill. Um, will they still give you credit when you come in with your own bag and they don't have to supply you with, with their bag? The bill is silent on that. Uh, but uh, right now, if you, if you don't have your reusable, reusable bags, the grocery stores will charge um, at, at minimum five cents. Mm -hmm. We think it's going to be in the nickel range uh, for this particular bag. Now, a CVS would fall under the same category as a Ralph's or a Vons because that is a bigger store that's, than that's a very correct. small. That's correct. And it's the grocery stores and the large retail pharmacies that will go into effect in 2012, and it will be the convenience stores and liquor stores that will go into effect in 2013. Great. Well, thank you for your leadership up there. Uh, Mr. Cardenas, for your leadership in the assembly on this issue, and and for the action we took today, but it's a long time in coming, and we have the great leader uh, uh, with you in position. I know my, my constituents in the Palisades are very proud of you, as I am very proud of you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Council Member. Thank you, Mr. Rosendahl. Mr. Kuretz. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just wanted to commend you for your work on this. Uh, I did one of the early, or maybe the first uh, bill to to attach a fee to single-use plastic bags, I believe in 2005 or maybe 2006, and it was so difficult back then, we couldn't even get it out of a very environmentally oriented committee, the, the Assembly Natural Resources Committee. Um, we had Californians Against Waste and a couple of environmental organizations, and that was it. Uh, to put together this, this amazing coalition of business and cities and environmental groups, um, 
has really been remarkable. So I just commend you on that. This is very exciting. I think we have a, a great chance to pass this and, and make some landmark progress on one of the key environmental bills that's been before the legislature in, in, in a number of years. So thank you for all your good work. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Uh, Mr. Zine. Well, good morning, good my morning. great assembly member from the uh, wonderful communities of Southern California. Uh, this reminds me of the smoking ordinance. When they tried to pass the smoking ordinance, all the bars were going to close and chaos was going to prevail. It also reminds me of recycling, where we have a blue bin, and we have the green bin, and we have the black bin, and the, the smoking uh, went outside and the smoking has reduced, but the bars have not closed. But now we have the recycle bins, and just this morning the trash picker in my community took out the, the goods in the blue bin, and we got used to it. It was a matter of adjustment, and we prepared for the future. And I've got one of these for you. This is the official Councilman Dennis Pizine shopping bag Excellent. that you can take to your markets, and many of the neighborhood councils have obtained these. And it's just like anything else. You have to readjust because when you go home, you throw the plastic bag and the recycle. It goes to the recycle once again. This you can reuse many, many times. So uh, people who need them in uh, the San Fernando Valley and 3rd Council District come by my office. We have them available. Many neighborhood councils have them. But it's just simply readjusting our attitude to help save the planet. So I commend you on moving this forward. I know there's been challenges along the way. A lot of people said the markets aren't going to be able to sell goods and how are you going to carry your items to the, to, the, to, the, to the car. You go to Costco and many people shop at Costco. And you're lucky if you get a box to take the stuff out. Obviously, you put it in the car, you carry it in the house. So uh, I'm going to give this to you. But people who need them say, how are we going to get them? How are we going to pay for them? We distribute them free to the community. But again, I commend you. And this matches your, your blue does. outfit. So I does. You can go I'm going to go shopping right after this meeting. Very good. Again, thank you. Thank you for doing this. Thank you, Council Member. Ms. Hahn. Thank you, Madam President. Um, Assembly Member Brownlee, we just really want to rise and support um, this bill. And I'm sure you're going to get the full support of our council today. And thank you for your, uh, your leadership. Um, as we've talked about, this has kind of been um, an issue that has been moving forward, hasn't quite ever made it yet. Uh, and we've been moving towards this idea of banning plastic bags for a while now. You've done such a lot of hard work. Your coalition um, with the grocers, uh, with UFCW, with the, uh, certainly the environmentalist community is a very strong coalition now, which I believe will help to ensure the success. And even as you mentioned uh, in your letter to us, uh, we've tried to just recycle these plastic bags. Um, and yet that still hasn't really caught on. It's only capturing about 5%, I think, of the plastic bags. And we know that these plastic bags end up uh, in the ocean. We know that they uh, injure or kill uh, much wildlife. Uh, or they end up in our landfills and last through eternity. Uh, so this is a, a great bill. We think it's going to pass this time. We want to be supportive. And we want to put the whole weight of uh, the city of Los Angeles uh, making sure that this is a success. I will, as, as Councilman Rosine said, it will take people um, a, a while to, to adjust to this. I mean, I think, you know, people sometimes even go to the grocery store, they've got the reusable bags in their car and then they forget and now a lot of stores are putting the sign, have you forgot your reusable bag, go back and get it. So it just takes time, it's the right thing to do. I like your uh, bag, Dennis. That's uh, that's very creative. I probably have about you know 2,000 Han for Lieutenant Governor uh, reusable uh, bags that I'm going to start giving out somewhere. And so uh, I ordered way too many of those. Uh, but anyway, congratulations, and uh, we we want to support this all the way to the completion. Thank you, Councilwoman, and I want one of your your bags. Okay. All right. <laughs> Mr. LeBond uh, is before you, Mr. Cardenas, and I'll call on you next. You had your button pressed. Well, hi, and thank you. Nice to speak with you. What about our seniors? Because our seniors, so, although sometimes uh, I don't know if there's any exemption for them, they have a, a number of small items that they take home from their grocery store. Uh, sometimes plastic has been stronger than paper. What do we say to that community? 
Well, the bill uh, doesn't have any provisions for the senior community. Although the seniors I see shopping usually are carrying a basket and with with their bags. So there, but there is no provision for seniors. There is a provision in in the bill for um, uh, folks who are poor. Um, and on food stamps, uh, but not a provision for well, seniors. I figure we look at it now. Here's the other issue, and I don't want to be graphic, so turn off 35. But if you take a plastic bag and you have a dog, this is a very effective way to remove the dog waste. What do we do about plastic bags for dogs? I'm sorry, Mr. Parks. Okay. What do we do about plastic bags that are manufactured for the trick of picking up dog waste? Well, um, there's still, you know, options out there. There won't be the traditional grocery store plastic bag. Will the, uh, will, will the, uh... but, but you would be able to purchase doggy bags uh, to pick up waste. Got it. And they won't be taxed. Uh, they'll just be like you put down in a box. In a box, in a box, yeah. they have them, they can do it. Yeah. Very good. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Cardenas. Thank you, Mr. Lebond. You actually uh, pointed out how difficult it is to write legislation where you're banning bags, but you're not banning all bags, and that's why there's, it's so, the motions sound so simple, but they get so thick pages and pages and pages of clarifications. So uh, thank you for clarifying how difficult it, it's been for Assemblymember Brownlee to get this, this far and to make all the changes um, to make sure that we don't in, inadvertently have those effects. But also, um, Maybe perhaps what we can do is council members promise that we will give all seniors in our city, uh, you know, reusable bags or something like that, and we can start our own campaign locally. Uh, we do still have that local control, right? We can give absolutely. Out those bags. Yes, absolutely. And also, um, on, on behalf of the maker of the motion, colleagues, I, I would like to ask for your support for uh, AB 1998, uh, the Brownlee bill. It has come a long, long way. This was deliberated when. Uh, Speaker Wesson was there, and when I was there, and now former Senator Alarcón was there, what have you. This, the different iterations of these bills uh, have been tried for well over 15 years. So I just want to commend you for bringing it this far, and hopefully, um, I don't know, can I ask you, what's the governor's office position so far on the bill? The, the governor's been signaling uh, that he's very interested in the bill, and the bill goes before uh, Environmental Quality Committee on Monday. Uh, it will probably then go to appropriations and uh, then to the floor. So to the Senate floor and then hopefully to the governor's office. Although, it, you know, your support is going to be very, very helpful. It's going to be, honestly, a very heavy lift in the Senate. There's is, no question. Is this the first bill to make it this far that actually has the Grocers Association on, on Absolutely. board? Absolutely. This is the first bill that has ever had the Grocers uh, on board with the bill. Yeah. So, yes. So, so I just wanted to point that out, that this bill has come a long way and it has uh, received the support of the traditionally uh, uh, strong opposition to this bill. So, again, it's commendable to you to have figured out how to make it happen and to actually advance this environmentally needed bill. And then also I, I tried to help Mr. Zine with his example about when we banned smoking, about everybody said the sky was going to fall and the world was going to end and the economic decline of California was going to occur. None of that happened and the smoke cleared. Just like this one, there's a lot of people who are saying that the world is going to end if we do this, yet at the same time, a well-crafted, very carefully written bill like this one is in fact the right kind of bill. Once again, congratulations and I ask for your eye support. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you. And thank you, colleagues. Thank you, Assembly Member. That matter is now up for a vote. Please open the roll. Close the roll. Wait a minute. There's a man in the back. I bear, maybe he had a card. Hold on a second. I'm sorry. I thought the cards were heard earlier. So those of you that are here before we take the vote, Let's hear from the public on this matter. Kirsten James, Heal the Bay. That's me. Oh, you were up there, but you didn't speak. Would you like me to step back? Or? Well, you can, you're already there. So go ahead and say okay, your uh, two, two minutes you. from there. Go ahead. Good morning. My name is Kirsten James, and I'm the Water Quality Director with Heal the Bay, and we're the sponsors of AB 1998. And as was previously mentioned, the status quo just isn't working. 
Our urban beaches look like trash dumps after every rain, and during Heal the Bay's over 400 beach and creek cleanups every year, we've seen firsthand the impact of single-use plastic bags on our environment. After a storm, streamside vegetation, in-stream habitats, and creek bottoms are littered with endless piles of plastic shopping bags. Streams and storm drains carry plastic bags and other items to the ocean where they impact our marine life. Although Heal the Bay is an environmental group, we can't help but think about the economic impacts of plastic bags as well. For example, bringing it home to the city of L.A., you folks have spent over $64 million complying with trash total maximum daily loads, and this ordinance is one step in the right direction to compliance. As Mr. Rosendahl pointed out, the council recognized the urgency of this issue back in 2008 when you voted 13 to 0 to support a policy that would ban plastic bags if the state didn't take action. Now we have a chance for the state to do the right thing and move forward with a uniform policy. As has already been discussed, there's a wide group of unique stakeholders joining hands on this issue. The grocers, the Western States Council of United Food and Commercial Workers, local governments, the environmental groups. The time is now. The stars are aligning. California can't afford these plastic bags any longer, and AB 1998 is a common sense approach that will reduce our consumption and dependence on these bags that are designated for one-time use. We respectfully urge you to support the resolution today. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Williams. I think they wanted you to sign this, too. Dr. Clyde Williams, 4115 Barrow Road, El Sereno, Northeast LA. And most senior citizens still use their own carry multiple use bags. So even us senior citizens are doing this already. Uh, many people have been waiting for this for a long time. The only question is, how much are those bags going to cost when you have to buy them from the store? I hope they're enough to make the incentive to be, say, a dollar a bag, a plastic bag. Thank you. Walter Bechtel, our final speaker on this matter. And then we will take the vote. Uh, okay, I came in here last year. I tried to explain to you something about a technology that's already been in place for disintegratable plastic bags since 1977. It's in the Los Angeles Times. I quoted you the article in 1977 concerning a company. I, uh, I don't have the article with me right now. I can pull it up. Uh, I believe the name was Best Tech Corporation out of South Carolina. And for some reason, they didn't want to put those bags into usage back then in 1977, and we've been using plastic bags that don't disintegrate. But that technology is very much available, and I don't think the way that you're going about this is the way to do this. I think you should first offer two kinds of plastic bags, immediately employ the disintegratable plastic bags uh, that are single usage, and if they want to... Uh, have plastic bags that don't disintegrate that can be used again and again and then make them pay for that because I don't think that people do break habits when you need them to. Uh, history has shown that they don't do that, they don't recycle, they don't stop smoking, they don't stop polluting the atmosphere with oil. I mean the most pollutant, polluting causing problem is the oil Companies. I mean, the entire Gulf of Mexico is being destroyed right now by our our oil that we are supposed to stop using. And I I think the only way to go about this is to do it subliminally, offer them like the United States penny that that the government realized you can't stop them from using the United States penny. So what you do is take zinc and you coat it with copper and make it look like the old pennies. And I think that's the best way to go about this with the plastic bag, you, uh, you force them to have these disintegratable plastic bags, and if they want ones that don't disintegrate, then you make them pay for those. But I think the way you've drafted this is, is, is not you. the way to go about this. Thank you, Mr. Bechtel. The matter is now before us. Open the roll. Close the roll. Tabulate the vote. Ten eyes. The matter passes. Thank you very much. We're going to number 38, Ms. Perry, number 38.
Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair. I wanted to call this item special today because torture is one of the most profound human rights abuses affecting millions of individuals and their families around the world, including many who now live in the Los Angeles region. And I know that Mr. Cardenas has been deeply involved in this issue for many, many years. In fact, Los Angeles is now the largest port of entry for incoming refugees and asylum seekers and is home to the highest number of torture survivors in the country. In fact, in fact, it's estimated that up to 35% of all refugees have been tortured. So today, we've been joined by Julie Gutman, who is now the Executive Director for the Project for Torture Victims, and Dr. Jose Quiroga, the Co-Founder and Medical Director for PTV, and some of their clients. PTV is one of the largest torture survivors organizations in the nation, and this year they are commemorating their 30th anniversary of supporting and helping those affected by torture who now live in the Los Angeles region. I am proud that such an organization has been doing work in our city for so many years, and that they are headquartered in the 9th District at Mercado La Paloma. I have asked them here today to present some of their uh, information and stories of survivors that they are supporting through their programs. Tomorrow is United Nations International Day in support of victims of torture, and this resolution will also declare our support and recognition of this day here in the city of Los Angeles. In addition, the city's recognition of this important day, PTV will be launching a program called Profit for Peace, joining with the city of Los Angeles, local businesses and restaurants, the Profit for Peace campaign will raise funds by contributing portions of their profits to PTV. And then when you mention PTV at any of, any of these restaurants and businesses, a portion ranging from 10% to 100% will be donated to the organization. These businesses are Louise's Trattoria, Takami Sushi, Robata Restaurant, Good Girl Dinette, Mochica, La Maison de Creme, Chichen Itza Restaurant, Thai Corner Food Express, Mercado Oaxaca, Pink's Hot Dogs, Tom, Pink's Hot Dogs, yes. All right. <laughs> Bold Balsam's uh, Hair, Skin, and Nail Salon, had, Handmade by Mariah, Studio City Yoga, and Alignment for Life, Life Coaching and Yoga. Okay. Now, I believe there are some representatives from some of the businesses here today, and if you would, uh, the representatives, please stand up and be recognized. <laughs> Thank you very much. And now I would like to ask Julie, Julie uh, Gutman and Dr. Quiroga, and the PTV clients were here to tell us more about the work they're doing. And I'll just give you three questions, and you, you know the time frame. The project for torture victims and how it came to fruition, the activities that you have planned to commemorate your 30th year in service, and how could people get involved? Julie Gutman. Thank you very much. Um, I want to say good morning to everyone. Um, I am Julie Gutman, now the new Executive Director of the Program for Torture Victims, and I am just very happy to be back at City Hall with all of you wonderful council members. On behalf of the entire staff and board, we have several board members here too of PTV, I want to extend our deep gratitude to the City Council for inviting us here today. And I'd especially like to thank Council Member Jan Perry, who has enthusiastically supported the idea of bringing greater visibility to the cause of torture victims in our city. Thank you, Council Member. As someone who has worked closely with all of you over the years to protect the rights of the vulnerable and invisible, I am truly honored to be here with you on this very special day. Indeed, it's entirely keeping with this Council's proud humanitarian record that you recognize the essential work of the Program for T Torture Victims as we kick off our 30th anniversary year on UN International Day in support of victims of torture. PTV was established 30 years ago by, by pioneers in torture treatment. Dr. Jose Quiroga, a Chilean refugee, and Ana Deutsch, an Argentinian refugee. It was the first human rights organization of its kind in the country. And through the dedicated staff and volunteers, PTV has literally provided a new lease on life to impoverished immigrant adults and children in Los Angeles whose lives have been shattered by state-sponsored torture. Individuals who live in each and every one of your council districts abandoned and aggrieved by their own countries, the thousands of men and women who have walked through our doors at PTV come from over 65 countries and have sought a new beginning here in Los Angeles, the city of second chances. 
and the home to the largest number of refugees, asylum seekers, and torture survivors in the country. And with the help of PTV, so many have found that new bit beginning, re-entering society, re-entering the workforce, and becoming contributing members of our community. Our clients have been tortured by their governments for a myriad of reasons. Some were fighting for democracy or advocating for women's rights. Others were persecuted because they refused to change their religious beliefs. Still others were targeted simply for being gay or lesbian or a member of a racial or ethnic minority. They came here to the U.S. to seek safety and refuge, to live in a place where people have freedom of expression and can practice their religious beliefs freely. Most importantly, they came here so they would no longer have to fear being persecuted, tortured, or killed because of who they are as a person. In short, they came to the U.S. because of the very foundations on which this country was built. And they came to Los Angeles with its long, proud tradition of welcoming immigrants from around the world. But the truth is, making it to this country and to Los Angeles is only the first step. Upon arriving, torture survivors face an overwhelming challenge. Not only do most arrive with nothing, no home, no job, no money, no health insurance, and often without any family, but they come here in the worst possible condition, bringing with them the physical, emotional, and psychological scars of torture. Asylum seekers must also secure their right to be in this country, an often grueling legal process that can drag on for years and years and force them to relive their trauma over and over again. Like Rosanna, who you see out there in the audience, who just, after five years in her asylum trial, has just received asylum. Congratulations, Rosanna. But that is why the Program for Torture Victims, we offer an integrated, interdisciplinary, and comprehensive approach to medical, psychological, legal, and case management services. We also conduct research through our amazing Director of Research and Evaluation, Megan Bertold. We conduct research on treatment methods and impacts and provide training to legal and healthcare professionals as well as the general public about the effects of torture on the individual and society. And over time, the truth is we are able to rebuild lives. Again, we are honored to, to have the City of Los Angeles as a partner in this sacred mission, and we look forward to working with you in the coming years to bring hope and healing to our clients. While the stories of our clients are truly horrifying, their determination to rebuild their lives and become active members of the community is truly, truly inspiring. In a moment, you're going to hear from these survivors. But first, I'd like to ask those who are present from the outstanding staff of the Program for Torture Victims, from the board, from volunteers, and any clients who wish to, to please stand. We'd like to thank you for your fabulous work. I'd also like to thank, as the council member Perry did, uh, the, the, the businesses who are participating in our Profits for Peace campaign. You businesses exemplify the very best in Los Angeles, a spirit of generosity and a desire to help people begin anew. I know that we have two of those business representatives with us today, and I'd like you to stand once again, Gloria Pink of Pink's Hot Dogs. and Jonathan Truman, Truman of Alignment for Life Yoga. Jonathan. And now, it is my great pleasure to introduce the co-founder of the Program for Torture Victims, Dr. Jose Caroga, a first-hand witness to the brutality of the Pinochet regime in Chile. Dr. Caroga is an internationally respected authority on torture and the recipient of the 2009 Socially Responsible Medicine Award from Physicians for Social Responsibility. Please welcome Dr. Jose Caroga. Thank you. I was one of the personal physicians of President Salvador Allende in Chile. As you know, the democratic government of Salvador Allende was overthrown on Tuesday, September 11, 1993, 
remember the same day of the terrorist attack in New York, okay. but the year before. And after this military coup, uh, I was remaining in Chile for around four years. I remember the most striking thing for me that was I entered the government palace very early in the morning in, during a democratic government and left in, in detention by the military forces a few hours later. And then this is a big shame from the moral city dictatorship in a few hours. After that, I was witness why I remained there of the terrible repression that we saw during the Pinochet regime that basically used any type of method from detention, arbitrary detention in that case, political killing and torture. For us, the most fundamental right as a human being is the right of our personal integrity. And torture is the most fragrant, really, violation of this right. When a person has been tortured, they change his or her life and also their family life forever. A tortured victim never going to be the same person before. And then they have a lot of terrible psychological symptoms, most of them, and also a lot of medical consequences. And these people sometimes migrate to other countries, and they happen that people who migrate to the United States and the city of Los Angeles, looking for a safe heaven. But not only they bring their suffering as a torture victim, they also have to deal with all the problems of migration in a country with a different language and culture. And then they have a lot of really need that we have to try to help to fulfill when they are here. And then this is the reason because we have a multifactorial professional really team that they can give them all the unmet need. The most important thing for us is trying to that the victim of torture could integrate their traumatic experience in something positive and they can be function and they can be productive citizen of in other country. And they have been and we have been shown that this is possible in spite of this terrible experience. And you are going to hear some brief comment for some of them. They have been able to really integrate, as I said, this traumatic experience in a positive way. And now they are productive citizens, or not citizens, some of them, and here in the United States, and especially here in the city of Los Angeles. Thank you for your attention. You are going to hear some of these statements now. Mm -hmm. Good morning. My name is Rosana Perez. I'm from El Salvador. I live in District 13, Consul President Eric Garcetti's district. I was a university student helping the campesinos and teachers in San Salvador. My husband was a university professor. He left one day and never came back. He was disappeared. Soon after that, the death squads in the middle of the night captured me. I was blindfolded, tied up, taken away from my daughter, forcefully naked and beaten. I was constantly tortured while I was in prison, persecuted for trying to build a democratic society. When I came to Los Angeles, the horrors of the war haunted me until I found out about PTV's program. I came to PTV and found a place where I could get help with all my complicated needs, medical, psychological, legal, and social services. I'm thankful to Anna Dodge, who was my therapist, and Dr. Quiroga, who was my doctor, and to the wonderful PTV staff. 
I was able to reveal my life and to help others who had endured experiences like mine. Thanks to the help of PTV, I'm able to help my community. I have become an active member of my community, helping to start El Rescate and Clinica Monsignor Romero, community-based refugee and immigrant health care organizations. To this day, I'm a strong advocate on immigrant, refugees, and women's rights. PTV gave me the strength to overcome and continue to give back to my community. At the same time, to overcome the pain that torture left in me. Those scars will remain with me for the rest of my life, but they would not destroy me as a human being. Thanks to PTV, I have regained my dignity as a woman and as a survivor of torture. The first time I came to Los Angeles City Council was in 1986. I came to request the Consul to accept a resolution to be passed to protect refugees from El Salvador and Guatemala. City Consul passed a resolution to make Los Angeles a sanctuary city and call Los Angeles a city of refuge. Today, I am grateful and proud to be a Los Angeles citizen. It means a lot to us that you are recognizing Los Angeles as a home to immigrants and refugees who have been survivors of torture, besides honoring the life-saving work that PTV does and also declaring United Nations International Day against torture as victims of torture day in the city of Los Angeles. Thank you. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Joe Wu. I live in District 8 in Baden Park District. I was an activist fighting for freedom and democracy in Burma. The military regime put me in prison and tortured me six times. The longest time was for three years. The military regime in a still strong pro-democracy activist and their family in Burma. I was lucky. I expected to come to the U.S. in 2004. It was very hard for me at first. It was afraid when I saw a security guard in uniform. Look like me. A friend told me about PTV when I expected the U.S. I left my life was over until I found PTV. PTV helped me start again. They wrote a report helped me get asylum. They helped me with my nightmare and my health. There should be more PTV in Burma and country where torture happens. I believe that. I continue to work for democracy in Burma. I have worked for LA County Agricultural Weight and Measure in Inspector. I own my house and my family and recently in citizen. I can vote. Thank you. Mr. Rosendahl, uh, on this matter, Mr. Rosendahl. Oh, there's one more speaker. One more, one more speaker? Oh, I'm sorry. Last, sorry. <laughs> okay, and, and then Mr. Rosendahl. I'm go, go ahead, sir. Okay. Uh, my name is uh, Abdullahi. Uh, I'm from Cote d'Ivoire, Africa, a very, very rich country in West Africa. For five years, I was persecuted due to political problems. One day, my family was attacked in midnight at my house, and my wife and brother were both killed in front of me. After I recovered from my own injuries, I then lived in hiding for two years before I could come to USA. I have not seen my children and other family members in 10 years. In 2003, I came to the United States, and a few months after I arrived, I found out about PTV. 
My first meeting with PTV will forever remain engraved in my memory. The welcome was filled with warm emotions, and I immediately noticed the quality, accessibility, and humanitarian side of what PTV consists of. I was a grand relief to find myself surrounded by people with a big heart. We share your sadness and pain. PTV helped me to find an entrepreneur who assists me pro bono. Also, PTV helped me to solve my medical problem at no cost at the Venice Family Clinic. Thank you, Dr. Kiroga. It is at this clinic I met Brigitte a volunteer lady for PTV who was there to be the interpreter for the doctor and me. My meeting with British marked a turning point in my life here in USC. She gave me hope, restored my dignity, made me reborn from the ashes. She helped me to find a job where I'm still working. By providing that job, Brigitte not only gave me back my self-respect, but also my financial independence. I would like to hand by repeating my thanks to PTV and its personnel for their enormous work that they accomplish every day to give back hope, smile, and dignity to all the shattered lives who come to them. I would like also to thank everybody who contributes to help PTV to, to help another people. God bless you. Thank you. Ms. Perry for Mr. Rosenthal and Ms. Perry first. Uh, is Mr. Rosenthal? Mr. Mr. Rosenthal and, uh, and also you. He's up I just want to just conclude All right. so mm -hmm. I can let Mr. Rosenthal. Mr. Mr. Rosenthal, please. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Having uh, traveled through 52 countries and sometimes with a backpack and a sleeping bag, uh, I've wandered around the earth and I've seen uh, torture uh, and I've seen uh, violence um, and it just tears me up. Uh, obviously, the three of you with your presentation is extremely compelling and real. As the openly gay guy here in the city council, my people are killed every day all over the planet. Malawi, two boys the other day were put in jail for 14 years because they expressed love uh, for themselves. I was in Chile when the people were in such pain and suffering. In 1975, they couldn't look at me because if they looked at me, they'd get arrested. I saw uh, up front uh, the torture that has gone on. And even in Iraq, where our troops are, when they find out somebody's gay, they go out of their way to kill them. And so uh, it is terrible uh, to see torture anywhere on earth. But thank God that there are people here in the room willing to talk about it. And thank you all in community for uh, putting yourself and energy in this issue. We can only make a difference by highlighting when we see this torture and violence happening. And doctor, God bless you for, for your energy and, and your work on it. And it's so good to see you in a job where you can make a huge difference um, on behalf of everybody here. So I, I'm very heartfelt by everything and we need to do better on this earth than we're presently doing. Thank you for being with us. Mr. Uh, Koretz now, Mr. Koretz. And then Ms. Perry. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I, I can't believe what uh, all the people here have gone through. And I just want to say I'm so glad that there are organizations and, and individuals uh, leading the effort to, to help them adjust and to support them. And uh, we want to do that as well on the council. So thank you all for being here. 
particularly happy to see you, Julie, in this position and doing the good work that you're doing. Um, I didn't know there was such an organization until recently, and, and I'm glad that such a thing exists because it has to be so difficult to go through. And, and we're just happy to hear that, uh, that, that this is happening and that we can, we can be helpful and supportive in some way. So I wish you all the best and continued success in this effort. Ms. Perry, please. Yes, thanks, Mr. Chair. I just want to thank Executive Director Julie Gutman and Dr. Jose Quiroga and all of the uh, kind people here at the table today who have shared their personal history with us. It has been a learning opportunity, and uh, I ask for an I vote. Very well. That matter is now before us for a vote, colleagues. Please open the roll. Close the roll and tabulate the vote. Ten eyes. Very well. Congratulations, and thank you. Yes. Mr. Clerk, next item number 25 for Mr. Parks. Mr. Parks, number 25. And we have cards on that matter? No, no. Okay. Uh, Mr. Parks, uh, we want to hear from the public the first, cards. All we have is a technical amendment that's been circulated. <clears throat> technical amendment on this matter, but we do have uh, three cards. Yeah, so we can go through the cards. and. Okay. Uh, Dan Wright. <coughs> Mr. Dan Wright. Followed by Mickey Jackson. Daniel Wright, 467 Crane Boulevard. On behalf of the Vandy Camps Coalition, Council Members, um, this week we've been before you on several occasions to discuss uh, our concerns about the use of federal money that uh, is represented in this motion. Um, federal money that will be used to rent the Vandy Camps campus from LA Community College District and in so doing will deprive the Northeast residents of a decade-long promise by the LA Community College District to provide adult educational opportunity at a satellite campus of Northeast uh, at, at the Northeast campus, a satellite intended for LA City College. Um, Essentially, the district will be inviting you, or the mayor's office will be inviting you to participate in what we have uh, put in a complaint to the federal government, uh, a violation of Title VI of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. That provision, Title VI, uh, mandates that federal funds not be used in a way that results in discriminatory discrimination against minority communities or has what's known as a disparate impact. In other words, you don't have to show that there's a racially discriminatory intent, you just have to show that there's a disparate impact. And certainly here, where for a decade a community has been told that it will have a satellite campus and the voters have voted millions of dollars to build a $72 million campus, and our community, the Northeast, is expected to continue to pay taxes and not receive the benefits of that program of LACCD is a violation of Title VI. Please keep that in mind during your deliberations as this program moves Thank forward. You. Thank you. You're welcome. Mickey Jackson followed by Laura Gutierrez. Mickey Jackson. Thus far, no one has contacted us to look at any records we have offered to share with you. We don't ask you to take our word. We just ask you to look at the documents. I hope that does not mean no one wants to be well informed about this issue before making a decision on a lease that could open the city's pockets to being sued and to being a party to, in fact, the key party to a federal violation. I hope it doesn't mean you are trusting the smooth assurances of LACCD and the mayor's office without carefully examining this. I understand that the usual procedure here is to defer to the council office of that district and perhaps the mayor's office and colleagues at LACCD. But if the city is sued, it will be everyone's district is, that is sued. If the city violates, it will be everyone in the city. 
and all of the taxpayers will suffer, not just a single office or the mayor. Please serve all of your constituents and protect them from this. All reassurances from those such as Mr. Martinez, who was here the other day, of both LACCD and the CDD, two entities who stand to benefit from this lease. A grain of salt is in order. It would do us all good to remember the words of President Harding regarding the Teapot Dome scandal that ruined his presidency. These are his words. It was my friends, my goddamned friends, who got me into this. Lord Gutierrez, please, our final speaker on this matter. Then back to Mr. Parks. Good morning, Lord Gutierrez, 3022 Edward Avenue, Los Angeles, California. I'm going to make sure that my words are short and sweet because at one day I might have to eat them. The programs offered through the WIB program are commendable. commendable. Done correctly, they can make positive changes to it for unemployed individuals. Done incorrectly, they may cause problems for the city of Los Angeles. Please reconsider it as you debate this to make a friendly amendment to remove the allocation of ARA funds at the Van de Kamp site and do not approve the lease. I do not think President Obama would want the ARA funds to destroy the 10-year promise satellite community college at the Van de Kamp site. Please do not let this site I have an asterisk uh, because of the investigations and what they're going to find um, once they are completed. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Mr. Parks. Back to you on this matter. Number 25, sir. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, colleagues, uh, this item was recently uh, before the Jobs Committee, and uh, Mr. Alakan, there was one instruction that did not get in the report, and that's 25A that's been circulated, and we ask that we move the report with uh, the, remove the committee report with this amendment. Mr. Cardenas. Um, Mr. Parks, uh, are you aware of, of um, whether or not it was clarified in committee about what kind of outreach was done uh, and also when, when the jobs would be available for these young people to start? Just to come up and he can okay. just give us a thumbnail because I didn't okay. uh, commit that to memory, Thank but you. He, he'd have that right at his fingertips. Can you start by reminding us what, what the goal is or the objective of how many job slots we, we hope to fill this summer? Yes, Greg Irish, uh, Workforce Investment Board Executive Director. Uh, we're actually using the emergency contingency funds to fund a summer jobs program that will get us in the neighborhood of 10,000 young folks employed this summer. Some activities have to take place before we actually start, which will be after the holiday season, the 4th of July. We anticipate starting. We have no objections to the motion. What we're going to do is report back per the motion in terms of what expenditures we actually incur in preparation for the program starting the two days after the 4th. Okay. And what methods of outreach uh, are you utilizing to make these young people aware that these opportunities are available to them? What we've done, and as much as there's eligibility required for actual enrollment in the program this year, we're working with the county welfare agency because you have to be someone who is actually receiving public assistance. So we are working through our nonprofit network, our family source centers, our work source centers, as well as those on the welfare roles, the public assistance roles, to advise them that this program is available to young folks who are receiving public assistance. Can you give me a, an example of public assistance that perhaps somebody might disqualify themselves and think that they don't qualify but they in fact do? If you're from a family that receives food stamps, you would be eligible. If you're AFDC eligible, you would be eligible for this program as well. They're all being notified. Any young person who's on the rolls or their family is on the rolls has been notified in writing by the Department of Social Services that they're eligible for this program and to report to specific work source and one source and family source centers. What if the only assistance that a young person is getting is in fact they're on the uh, uh, free lunch program? Uh, what, what if, for example, they, they don't, they're not participating in other public assistance, but they're actually participating in only that one public assistance? There's, Would that qualify them? Uh, there's specific eligibility. We're, we're concerned that last year's program and the years that we've, we've operated this program with general fund money as well as federal, federal money, the federal money is no longer available. So we are not going to be serving all of the young people that we used to serve in the past. 
status. There's specific eligibility related to the public social services per, uh, system. Uh, we will not be able to serve most of the young, or some of the young people that most. we served in the past, most, uh, because we don't have those federal funds. And we're calling out to the federal government to make that the funding available. That was available last year, by the way, in terms of the Obama dollars. We can't get it through Congress. There are a number of folks who will not have the benefit of this program because they do not qualify for this program. Th there's three categories of cash um, uh, supports. So it's CalWORKs. It's uh, food stamps, uh, you know, a SNAP program. And the third one is foster youth that are emancipated that are on general relief. Those until, are the until three. what age? Until what that age? category of foster youth until what age? I believe it's 21 or is it 24? It's 21. Until to age 21. Okay, so those are the exact three categories of people that will be eligible. So for a foster youth in Los Angeles who was emancipated in their 18, 19, 20, and 21 years old or before the age of 21? Up to 21. So okay, so they have to be 20 and a half or what have you, but once their 21st birthday, if it's already occurred, then unfortunately they can't I believe that's the case. Yeah. Okay. Yes. The, the reason why I wanted to have that dialogue is because um, inevitably um, a lot of people who qualify for some reason or other don't get communicated with. Yep. And I'm not blaming any, anybody on that. I mean, even in the closest relationships, there's miscommunication. But I just wanted to get a better understanding as to what, what that is. And then my last point and question is um, what is the pay ranges that, that are available to the youth in this it depends on the age of the youth. Um, young folks, have, remember, we're going f up to um, a certain age. Yeah. The older youth generally make a better wage. Depends on the work site, but primarily we'll be paying actually minimum wage, but there will be some variation. But in this program, using HHS dollars, everyone is receiving $8 an hour, which is the minimum wage. But there's some fluctuation in how many hours you're allowed to work, and that depends on the... Yeah the employer. And this is the 20% the non-federal match with supervision being the match. So it's 25 to 40 hours per week, and that depends on the employer. Okay. And thank God we're not going with federal minimum wage, because it's much less than $8, That's right? Yes, exactly right. we don't use federal. Okay, thank you very much. All right, that the matter is now before us uh, with the uh, amendment. See no other colleagues on the matter. Open the roll. Close the roll. Tabulate the vote. Ten ayes. Mr. Cardenas. President, Mr. President, if, if we could have uh, items that have already passed go forth with item 20 and uh, item 34, item 39. And also, Mr. Parks, would you like this item 25 to go forth with? Yes, thank you. Item 25 forthwith. Thank you. Mr. Clerk, you get that? Forthwith on those items. Thank you very much. Okay, colleagues, we have um, a quorum of ten. We have seven items want to be in closed session. No one else is excused, and we need to finish this agenda. So with that, we will proceed with public comment. Mr. Yes, Mr. Lebon. the agenda, and I Pardon know me? we're the agenda. We have one minute public comment, unless they need more time. Mr. Attorney, is that permissible under public comment to have it abbreviated? If, 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 if council is in danger of losing a quorum, one minute is fine, although there should be an effort to allow two minutes. Well, we are at 10, and I don't want to lose the quorum, and we do have other items plus a closed session, so let's do that. Mr. Cardenas? What item are we going to now? We're doing a public comment now. We have public comment we haven't oh. taken yet, but we have seven items. One of them is a closed matter, and we're down to 10 members, so we want to finish this so no one else can leave, obviously. So Ms. Hahn, thank you very much. David Wright? Now, these folks already spoke... Well, they filled out cards, Mr. City Attorney. They have already spoken. They filled out cards under public comment, and they've already spoken on this matter. They should be allowed to speak on general public comment. But not relating to the matter that they already spoke about. Oh, no, right. Okay, well, Mr. Wright. Daniel Wright of the comment. Silverstein Law Firm. On behalf of the South Central Farmers Action Fund, Kramer Meadows, and m and Gabay, item number 36 on your agenda regarding placement of the Slauson Central Project on your July 8th meeting agenda has passed earlier today. So I wanted to bring to your attention some key questions you should be asking yourself between now and July 8th. 
we are acutely aware of the tradition of the council to do whatever the council member wants in whose district the project may reside. Questions that you should be asking on this project include, what is the personal interest that council member Perry has that now requires her to recuse herself on this project? Perhaps this project has a ticking time bomb that is about to blow up in your face if you continue to forward, go forward with this bungled CRA project. Council Member Perry has historically voted for and advocated approval of this project, so what has changed? That's one question. Two, why is this matter not being sent back to the CRA board with direction to significantly reduce the developer's guaranteed financial 18 to 19 percent profit due to the dramatic change in the financial markets? The out-of-state developer will reap millions of LA tax profits and immediately sell the project to a guaranteed buyer and take the money to Florida. Three, what is the status of the buyer, the guaranteed buyer, concerned citizens of South Central LA? How many other CRA projects has concerned citizens defaulted upon? How many judgments has the city obtained against concerned citizens for failures to repay other CRA uh, and housing department loans? If, you are seen, uh, if you've seen the Academy Award nominated film The Garden, you saw how concerned citizens played a role in the tragic loss of the South Central Garden. Finally. Should we learn questions from the Slauson Central Project regarding how to better treat owners and owner participation rights? In this case, my clients were ready to construct a comparable project without public subsidy. Eminent domain power was used to take their property from them and give it to the politically favored developer. These are questions you should be asking. Thank you. Ruth Sarnoff. Good afternoon, Council. My name is Ruth Sarnoff. Cities, counties, and states all over America are struggling with their budgets, yet military spending is off the table when it comes to the national budget. Why is that? The U.S. currently has 900 military bases in 62 foreign countries which is 95% of all foreign military bases on the planet. The remaining 200 countries have the other 5%. World War II ended 65 years ago. Still, we have 50,000 military personnel in Germany and over 40,000 in Japan, with hundreds of thousands more stationed in bases around the world. According to the National Priorities Project, taxpayers in Los Angeles will pay $8 billion for total defense spending in fiscal year 2011. The project looked at what that money could buy if used to support education, health care, public safety, affordable housing, renewable electricity, and other peaceful pursuits. The trade-offs are astounding. Changing some of our priorities could indeed rain a perfect storm, raining jobs on local communities. Available on the internet is information on the financial and human needs of our wars, past, present, and future based on government data. The National Priorities Project has researched that data to determine the total defense spending for cities across the country. Another good source is the organization Peace Action. You can also you. Google list of United States military bases. Thank I have you. a recommendation. Thank you, ma'am. Your, your time is up. Uh, Dr. Williams is next speaker. Ma'am, you have two minutes to speak yes. and your time is now up. So the next speaker, come forward, please. Dr. Williams not here. Speaker. Cal Clark, Mr. Clark. Thank you, Councilman. Please, may I have everyone's attention? This is a very important matter, and two minutes is just not enough to get it out, but I'm going to get as much as I can. My name is Cal Clark. I'm a parent from the North Hollywood District of Toluca Lake. I'm here to talk to you about a matter concerning our children, a matter that is that it's important that you take your attention because we're running out of time on this. Right now, we're facing 140 low-income and minority children are being kicked out of the 
COLA swim program. The COLA swim program is a USA swimming sanctioned swim program that allows children to advance onto the Olympics. The COLA program allows low-income and minority families to follow this dream. We've recently received a letter from Patricia Delgado giving us 45 days to find other alternatives to the cancellation of this program. There is no other alternatives. We cannot afford to join USA-sanctioned swim programs. Pardon? She's Patricia Delgado. She's a City Aquatics Director. She single-handedly made this decision. A gentleman talked about systemic industry, uh, and institutionalized discrimination. It falls into that category when the people of the community were not given an opportunity to increase our fees, to find alternate funding ways or sponsorship. They just all and out just canceled this program, kicking 140 minority kids to the curb. I contacted USA Swimming. This goes directly in the face of everything that they are trying to accomplish, which is to make swimming more inclusive. I have my two children here, Spencer 10 and Muriel, and I'm telling you, there are more children just like this. The two minute, I can't give you all the information. If you'd like to talk to me, I could share it with you. We desperately, desperately need your help. Parts and parts, health and aging, Kenny, Mr. Weston, we're going to take this issue up. This is a cause effect of our budget and to decrease the ability to do the recreation program. I'll see you right here at the road. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. It's a program. It's a gateway. It's an opportunity. We're not spending money. We're investing in our children. We understand that, sir. Thank you. Carol Inspector. Carol Inspector. City Council President and members, my name is Karen Spector. I'm with the Jewish Federation of Greater Los Angeles. I'm here today to note the fourth anniversary since Hamas, Islamic Jihad, and other terrorist groups attacked, wounded, and kidnapped Israeli Army Corporal Gilad Shalit and killed two of his fellow soldiers. Yesterday, the United House of Representatives, I'm sorry, the U.S. House of Representatives passed a resolution calling for Gilad Shalit's immediate release and reaffirming the U.S.'s support for the safety, security, and welfare of the soldiers and families of the State of Israel. Today and every day, the Congress of the U.S. and others must call for the immediate and unconditional release of Corporal Shalit and all other missing Israeli soldiers. For four years, four years, over 1,450 days, Gilad Shalit has been held virtually incommunicado. In contrast to most of the most fundamental standards of human conduct and international rules and regulations. He was just 19 years old when he was kidnapped. He's now 23 years old. His life is passing by as he's held captive, and we must note this. The city of Los Angeles has a strong humanitarian record, and it's very important that we take a stand as well and note that this is not an acceptable way to move forward the peace process, to hold an Israeli soldier who was cap captured while he was in within the Israeli border um, and hold him from his family and from communication with the rest of the world. I call on the city of Los Angeles to note this and to do what we can to support the state of Israel as it furthers the peace process. Thank you. Thank you. Bobby Cooper. Bobby Cooper. My name is Bobby Cooper. And I'm here today to discuss uh, terrorism. We're talking about terrorism and myself. Fifteen years of terrorism by the Los Angeles Police Department Rampart Division. We're talking about uh, Sergeant Lisi, Rayos, and Sanchez, and others. Last night, my apartment was a burglarized. They work for these attorneys. You know, moonlight for them. You know, they burglarized my house, and guess what they took? Insurance forms that the attorneys are stealing from me. Insurance policies where they're stealing monies out of my mother's account and my account. My mother's dead. I'm the head of the state. I'm the only one left. My brother's dead. My mother's dead. My father's dead by questionable circumstances. On or about 4 o'clock, original Hart's insurance policy was taken from my room with uh, Larry Parker's name on it and Peter Weisner. Three correspondent letters from Mercury Insurance Company. Four policy numbers with the names of Larry, with Larry Parker and attorney Peter Wozner. Correspondence from Hartford Insurance Company. Attorney Larry Parker relating to uh, Liberty Mutual Insurance. He ain't got no business in Liberty Mutual Insurance at the Arterial Credit Union. It's man the crook. And they're harassing me to death using Los Angeles Police Department. They're burglarizing my apartment, taking 
policies, erasing numbers, and also Parker Stanberry, a law firm that I hired with regards to this problem. They joined the folk. They're all the way up in Ohio taking monies from me. They belong to me. I'm sick of it. I need you to do something about it immediately. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Arnold Sachs. Sir. Arnold Sachs is our next speaker. Thank you. Good afternoon, Arnold Sachs. The new fiscal year begins in six days. So can we get a count from the council exactly how many layoffs were processed by the city? The numbers that were thrown around, 3,000, 2,000, 1,400, I believe was 750. Yet I also believe that only less than 300 were actually processed. But you have a new fiscal year beginning July 1st. So what happens with the other 400 people? Why did it cost $26 million when you cap to, to eliminate less than 300 people? Because that's the pay raise that the unions got because you capped the ECAP, the ERIP e program. For 200 more, 200, more, 200 more people into that program would have saved the city $26 million. But that money was budgeted into this deficit. So you considered that. Nice action. Which brings me back to Wednesday's meeting regarding the red lights. How sharp was that officer when he answered your question regarding the lawsuit Councilman Zion, almost like he knew it was coming. How about a follow-up question? The city involved in the lawsuit, what is their cost to revenue action? I mean, they're in having red light program. Are they losing money on their red light program? Did you compare notes with them? It's costing the city almost $300,000. And to have that information on hand, on hand, yet one, a $1 billion bond sale for capital comes before the council. Nobody knew that the list of entities involved in that bid, some of them were involved in a lawsuit against the city. And the beat, uh, I won't get it done. Sorry. Thank you, Mr. Sachs. I was coming about you, Mr. Laura Gutierrez. Ms. Gutierrez, not here. Mickey Jackson. Mickey Jackson, not here. And our final public speaker, uh, DJ Cote. DJ Cote. I don't see that person here. All right, uh, that's public comment. Thank you, Mr. Clerk. Next item, please. Council member, that brings us to item number 19. Pardon me? Called, that brings us to item number 19, called special by Mr. Parks. Mr. Parks, number 19, and we do have cards on number 19. Yeah, we'd have the cards first, and then we'd like to have the CAO and the CLA to come to the table. Mr. Sachs and Dr. Williams. Dr. Williams is not here. Arnold Sachs is here. Those are our speakers on 19. And we'll go back to Mr. Parks on number 19. Again, on all sides, I believe the wastewater debt system. This is what you just talked about last week when you talked about the bonds to to get the money to help pay the city debts. This is another list unknown that the entities involved in getting this credit, some of them are involved in a lawsuit. Do you have the correct information for this law? Do you have the correct information in front of you to be able to make a I want to say educated guess, but that would give me, be giving too much credit out here. But a, a decision that would be beneficial to the public and not, and not to hear speeches about how we're steamrolled by banks and everybody else, which is a business decision, but your ability to have the, the information to clarify these things for the city. That's what's important here. Thank you. Mr. Parks. 
be with Merrill right now? Well, that's what we need to ask. Good afternoon. Uh, I just wanted you to kind of walk through this issue and tell us what's before us and also what the urgency is about this matter and then also advise us as to what banks are actually involved or uh, lending institutions are actually involved. So I bargain with the CAO's office. What you have before you is a request uh, for authority to execute credit facilities for the wastewater system debt program. There are two components for the commercial paper program and for series 2008. Uh, for the commercial paper program, the existing facilities expire on June 30th, so we're seeking the authority immediately so we can go ahead and replace those facilities. For the series 2008, those facilities expire in, in a few weeks, although we're, we're combining the items so we can move forward together. Uh, the banks that we're working with for the commercial paper program is Wells Fargo, State Street, and Calsters. For the Series 2008 program, we're working with J.P. Morgan and Bank of America, Merrill Lynch. Okay. Did those lending institutions or banks come from a previously approved list? Partially. For commercial paper, we had uh, three banks previously. One bank notified us of uh, their decision to terminate the facility when it expired. So the two remaining banks uh, partnered up with Wells Fargo and presented a joint offer. For the Series 2008, we attempted to negotiate with the existing facilities. Uh, one was Bank of America, and we were able to reach an agreement with them. The other bank, we were never able to reach an agreement with them in a timely manner, so we reached out to other banks that we know provide credit facilities for an amount that we needed, and the bank that provided the most favorable terms was J.P. Morgan. Okay. And also, in the issue, what happens, or, or what's our options today? Is there a timeline that we must meet? Uh, if we don't meet that timeline, what are the issues that confront us? If we are unable to close on the commercial paper uh, credit facilities by Monday, then by Wednesday we will have to pay $300 million on the commercial um, paper. How much is that? $300 million outstanding okay. on the commercial paper program. Okay. And then on the other transaction? And the other transaction, if we do not close those facilities, then we will owe $444 million. Okay. What are our options as to the institutions that you're bringing forth to us as to replacing them or having uh, 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 options to select others? It's very limited at this time because of what's gone on with market conditions and, and just generally the availability of credit. We are unable to work with any European banks. They're not interested in doing this. Unable to work with what? With European banks. Okay. Uh, we attempted to negotiate with the Canadian bank, and that was the bank that was never able to commit to us. So we're really left with just American banks, and these are the banks that we have on our list, and we reached out to. Okay. Then how long have we known this date is going to come? We started this process in January. Uh, we were aware, of course, when these facilities were executed back for the CP program in 2005, we executed the original facility. For the series 2008, that was executed in May of 2008. What would it have taken for us to get this information well in advance to us being pushed against the wall today for a decision that's a, a week away that we would have to find $700 million in cash money? We went through our normal process of trying to reach out to the existing facilities. Uh, in hindsight and after the discussion that went forward on the TRAN, we could have reported, given the status report earlier on, we were just trying to protect our negotiating position with the banks that we were negotiating with. Okay. Uh, colleagues, this is a, a, a very similar as the TRAN in the sense of the time timeliness and also the seriousness, but I'm going to ask the CAO and the CLA, even though we've gone through that laborious process to set up the benches so that we can have people available, that we have to find a way that the council is made aware, aware well in advance of what the pending circumstances are and what are our options well before we're within a two or three week period. And we also need to have some guidance as to if banks that are part of the lawsuit, how do we address these financial conditions if the council as a policy chooses not to have them involved in these discussions. So those are two things that I ask that we can get back quickly into budget and finance as we discussed on trans but as far as this is just uh, colleagues this is just like trans I don't think there's 
a whole lot of options. Uh, 700 million in two weeks or approve this document. And the last time I checked, we don't, do not have 700 million in two weeks. And so this is something that we're going to have to fix the situation after the fact. Thank you. Mr. Cardenas. Try to make this quick. Um, it appears that one of the banks that's participating in one uh, of the forms of the notes is the uh, Merrill Lynch? Bank of America Merrill Lynch. Okay. I'm sorry, what, what is it? I'm sorry? Merrill Lynch, you said? It's Bank of America Merrill Bank Lynch. Bank of America Merrill Lynch. And Wells Fargo? And Wells Fargo. And also J.P. Morgan Chase? Yes. Okay. And two of those three, uh, there are some lawsuits that are in process relative to two of those banks, it's my understanding. And if they're not lawsuits, there are issues that the city of Los Angeles has identified with two of those banks. Correct. Okay. On different matters, not on these particular bonds. Unrelated. Okay. Unrelated. Um, so is there anything that precluded us from involving perhaps um, Wells Fargo on more of these transactions rather than just one of the three? Uh, no. It's, it's up to, it's their decision as to how much uh, credit they're willing to commit to the city for this particular okay. program. Is there anybody within your office that can tell us whether or not they they expressed to us that that was the limit of their participating the participation on these three matters? That's what they expressed to us. In oh, they did. In, yes, they did express that for this you. program. In what form did they express it? And the verbal in, conversation, in verbal email, verbal conversation. Hmm. And is it normal to? Uh, accept that kind of understanding on a verbal conversation when we're dealing with three hundred, four hundred million dollars and such. Normally, or what happened with the commercial paper program is, as I mentioned, the two banks that we had existing facilities with reached out to Wells Fargo to see if they were willing to step in and take over the portion of the credit facility that the other bank was terminating. So they expressed interest in accepting that that particular. Size. So Wells Fargo did express interest in stepping in in that particular case, but are you aware or not that they were actually asked if they could take the place of another bank on the other two uh, transactions? Uh, no, not specifically on the series 2008. Okay. Um, all right. Well, one one thing that I'd like to to compliment you on is that your directness of your answers and your simplicity of your answers and the lack of color commentary uh, in your answers. So thank you very much. All right, that matter is before us. Mr. Riddle, do you have any comments on this? Mr. Parks? We're, we're going to circulate 19A in behalf of Mr. Uh, Alicon that uh, just asked for some specific information about report backs uh, that we will get around. And so if we can just hold that for a second until we have this in Yes, you can ask now, Mr. CLA, have you ever talked to the county to see what if the city and county got together and focused on banks, like we're focusing on this issue? Um, it, 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 of all government entities in Southern California in some way, the big ones, you know, that would have a, maybe a stronger punch. Just a suggestion, meaning that what does the county, does the county do anything like what we're doing right now? They, they do, certainly, yes. I got it. So maybe if we do it together, it would be a stronger punch. That's just the thought. Thank you. 19A, I just signed it, so it's going to be circulated. So it will take a few minutes to be circulated. I was just asking for a report back in 15 days on giving us some idea over the next six months what we might be confronted with so we're not getting them incrementally. Okay. So, Mr. Parks, we shall wait till the uh, amendment is circulated. Colleagues, any questions on the amendment? We'll wait till it's circulated to. Uh, and, and we're going to move the recommendations of the CAO on this I 19 with the amending 19A. Move forward with the amendment of 19A without any other questions, colleagues? It is being circulated at this moment. I just want to make sure we are following procedure to make sure you have a copy of it. It's being circulated around the horseshoe. Okay, it's now circulated, reviewed. Any questions? Open the roll. Close the roll. Tabulate the vote. Ten eyes. Very well. On number 11, let's continue that to July 9th, please. Number 11. And 
Mr. Clerk, the next item, please, as Ms. Perry takes over the helm. Madam President, that brings us to item number 10. All right, thank you very much. Council Member, there are cards. Joseph Arroyo? Is Joseph Arroyo present? Mr. Arroyo, you are our only public speaker. Uh, yes, I'm here today on behalf of uh, my manager uh, or owner of the uh, property at uh, 7650 Sapota Boulevard in Grand Nice. And we're here to pay a uh, financial obligation that our tenants are financially obligated to pay. However, though, the owner is paying today uh, for the annual inspection fees for the uh, auto mechanics at his property. Uh, we're paying this under protest. Uh, we feel that the owner should not be responsible for paying the tenant's obligation, financial obligation. Uh, I feel that this is an example of uh, the city not being business friendly. Um, we have a uh, contractual agreement with our tenants uh, that makes the tenants responsible to comply with city regulations and uh, also the uh, fees that are imposed on them. Uh, on that contract, we are not co-signers to be responsible for our tenants' financial obligations. Um, if you would imagine for a moment a tenant that uh, owes a landlord <clears throat> rent and moves out, several months rent by the way, and moves out in the middle of the night owing electric bill, gas bills, water bills, and Imagine if the owner would have to be responsible for those financial obligations as well. We would be out of business. The owner could not afford to pay these financial obligations that are imposed on our tenants. And for that reason, we are protesting uh, the matter. Uh, but again, we are here also to make that payment. Thank you for your time. And also, I would like to mention before, I know you guys get a lot of bad uh, publicity, but I would also like to uh, commend uh, uh, Councilman Cadenas. Every time I call his office, we always get immediate response. So thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Mr. Cardenas. Th thank you very much. And uh, as the gentleman just said, we, the, office, the department has confirmed that the payments have been made. Thank you very much. And then whatever procedures that legally ensue from now on, we, we hope and expect and appreciate that everything will be adhered to. So thank you very much for your comment and uh, for your participation. And uh, council members, uh, in the interest of time, I'd like to move this item forward. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Cardenas. Uh, would you please open the roll on this item, Mr. Clerk? Council, uh, council members, would you like to receive and file this matter as much as, as uh, a payment has been received? All right, great. Thank you. Uh, go ahead and close the roll. Thank you. Tabulate the vote. Ten eyes. All right, next item. Next item. Uh, there's a special one, and the maker of the motion will speak to the findings. All right. Uh, I think that's Mr. Koretz. Mr. Koretz, your special one is up. Yes, thank you. We wanted to... Uh, put this item on under Rule 23 um, for several reasons. The constituents came to us with this issue on Wednesday evening and it wouldn't have provided us the time to post it. Today is June 25th and it's the fourth, fourth anniversary of Gilad Chalit's kidnapping and therefore action would have to be done today to be relevant. And Congress is set to act on this item as we understand it today and we want to be part of the the wave of help for this young man in, in recognition uh, of the fourth anniversary of his kidnapping. Thank you, Mr. Koretz. Uh, would you please open the roll, Mr. Clerk? Close the roll. Tabulate the vote. Ten eyes. Thank you very much. Next item. Take another vote. Oh, on the findings. No, I'm sorry. Mr. Koretz, now we go to the, the, the motion itself. Do you need to speak again, or would you like to speak again? Uh, if, I could, if I could just add briefly on the item, 
that uh, in the four years since his abduction, there have been an outpouring of international support. Um, and in, in the U.S., uh, cities such as New Orleans, Miami, and uh, uh, outside of the U.S., Paris and Rome have named him an honorary citizen of these locales. And the city of Los Angeles has always been and will continue to be an advocate for peace and stability in Israel and the Middle East. And so therefore we are declaring this as Gilad Shalit Day in the city of Los Angeles. And we join the leadership throughout the world, including the U.S. Congress, in demanding an immediate unconditional release by his Hamas captors. And we rededicate ourselves to pursuing peace in Israel and the Middle East. Thank you, Mr. Koretz. Now, Mr. Clerk, if you could open the roll on the motion itself. Close the roll. Tabulate the vote. Ten eyes. Thank you very much. Okay, we just voted. Um, well, I was on the queue. Uh, no, actually, it popped up as we were voting. I was watching the screen. Go ahead and speak, but we did vote. Okay. Go ahead and speak. Uh, all I want to do is, is, is thank... Uh, Mr. Koretz for putting it out there. We've got to resolve the, the issues in the Mideast. We can't continue to keep the kind of negativity around the planet happening. We need to support Israel, and we need to support freedom for everybody. And thanks for this motion. Great. Thank you. All right. Uh, Mr. Re Mr. Koretz has requested that this go forthwith. All right. Next item. Madam President, that brings us to item number 26, called Special for Cards. All right, Dr. Clyde Williams. Dr. Clyde Williams does not appear to be here. And Arnold Sachs, is Arnold Sachs still here? Uh, Dr. Williams and Dr. S uh, Mr. Sachs. Okay, and then while we're waiting for Mr. Sachs to come up to the uh, podium, we do have a special meeting that once we conclude this agenda, we will go into the special meeting and we have a few items in that and then we'll be able to conclude. Yes. Question. On this assessment, does it matter if the person speaking lives in the city of Los Angeles or not? It doesn't matter, matter that he lives outside the city of Los Angeles. That's correct. Thank you. Mr. Sachs? Yes, thank you. This is, seems to be more double dealing. The um, assessment revenue is $40 million, but the um, DWP is paying the city, what was that, $300 million? Just a curious, I mean, the, the bookkeeping that goes on and the shuffling of money that goes back and forth between these accounts and who's paying who and what's being paid and where is it being paid and how is it being paid. And then you wonder why programs are shorted, why programs are shut down, why staff is cut, why you can't keep track of who's on first, what's on second, and who's on third. Because I don't know. Oh, that's right. He's third base. Thank you. Okay, thank you. There are no speakers in the queue on this item. Uh, please open the roll. Close the roll and then tabulate the vote. Ten eyes. Next item. Item 31 called special for cards. All right. Mr. Sachs, you're, you have a card here for item 31. So while Mr. Sachs is coming up here, Mr. Sachs, do you still want to speak on item 31? All right. Okay, yeah. Come on, Mr. Sex. Um, this... You're so cheap. You're so cheap. Um, this item, I'm just wondering, the Second Amendment to the existing a IAA, if, the, I, if you have an existing agreement, then why does it say that you're going to turn in a new agreement in this item? I just don't understand it. And... What is this agreement, how, where does this affect the um, LADWP and its coal-fired plants that it needs to eliminate? As a matter of fact, I just read in the Wall Street Journal that the California legislation just voted to enhance the amount of um, green energy generated by utilities up to 33% by the year 2020. So that was just in today's Wall Street Journal. Um, so does this agreement in any way reflect on that ability? Thank you. And you're really cheap. All right, thank you very much. Uh, no speakers in the queue. Would you please open the roll, Mr. Clerk? Close the roll. Tabulate the vote. Ten eyes. Okay, thank you. 
What is our next item? Madam President, do you wish to recess the regular and go into the special meeting? Yes, that'll be fine. Alec on Cardenas, Hahn, Weezer, Koretz, Kikorian, LaBanche, Parks, Perry, Reyes, Rosemont, Smith, Weston, Zion, Garcetti. Ten members present and a quorum. This is a one item agenda. It's okay. uh, item 39. It's an item for which public hearing has okay. not been held. Ten votes are required right. for Mr. consideration. Mr. Sachs, I'm calling you again while you're taking your time to come up here. If Ruth Sarnoff is closer to the mic, is Ruth here? Ruth Sarnoff? Okay, let's see. All right, let's start the clock. Uh, and then, Ruth, you're our next speaker. That's great. I'm taking my time. It's unfortunate I can't press a button and, and talk for another six minutes like you take your time. But this item, you're looking for funding, so here's an, exam an idea to come up with that I thought about. Why not stop? Somebody mentioned changing the date of this meeting. But why not cancel Friday city council meetings so you can feel the pain that this public feels? Why not cancel it and move these presentations and these REIT violation awards to Tuesday and Wednesday. And you could use Friday for committee meetings. That way nobody would be paid. You'd be cutting services and city libraries and city parks and city employees and city health care and child care services would remain open and remain funded by the amount of money that's spent and wasted Listening to Thank this. you very much. Blow Mr. LaVange or Mr. Cardenas, did you wish to make a comment? Okay. All right, madam, you are our next speaker. For the record, please give us your name. Could I inquire what uh, item I'm speaking on now? Is this 39? Okay. Okay. Uh, I, I just was uh, noting that there was no information on it, and I was wondering if it went through normal committees and why there's no um, impact is it's a million plus dollars for this and I wondered how it affected the youth development program because it's being taken from a different fund and being funded out of the uh, mayor's gain reduction and youth development contractual services account and I just thought it should needed some ex explanation. I don't know. Thank, thank, thank you, you ma'am. Uh, maybe uh, once you hear the discussion on the item, it'll make a little bit more sense. Our uh, Mr. Mr. Lebon staff can go sit with her and discuss it with her. All right. Thank you, Mr. Lebon. We'll open the uh, roll on this item. Close the roll, then tabulate the vote. Ten eyes. Next item. For, uh, 39 forthwith, as requested by Mr. Cardness. And Madam President, do you wish to adjourn the special and go back to the regular? If we've completed all the items in the special agenda, please adjourn the special meeting. And that takes council back to the regular meeting, and that leaves item 16 called special by council members Rosendahl and Hahn, and I do believe council wishes to go into closed session. Before we go into closed session, I would like to call Mr. Sachs back up to the podium, and uh, you can start the clock. Please. Democracy in action. So again, looking for operations in a budget. Again, I asked about the forty, the thirty, the twenty-six million dollars. How that was budgeted. And Mr. Koretz on Friday or Wednesday with his discussion on the red light camera, he asked a question about. Um, incentivizing and the city attorney mentioned that the the company would not be able to benefit from the incentives which is exactly what happened in the contract renegotiations the unions benefited from the incentive that you allowed by saying if you lay anybody off we will give you a, a pay increase knowing full well that the city faced budget deficits and had no other recourse, actually, than to lay people off. Because Thank you, you put very a much, Mr. Sachs. All right, Mr. Rosendahl, you are on the queue, and you'll be our first speaker on the yeah, item. And, and I know that um, people have to leave, so I, I don't want to take too much time. I would like the library um, management to come up real quickly. We're told by the city attorney we do, do as much as Let we can. Let me check with the city attorney to make sure that that is appropriate, Mr. Rosendahl. It, it appears that this discussion is appropriate for open session regarding budget balancing matters uh, as reflected on the agenda description. Any discussion in closed session can only be about labor negotiations and status of labor negotiations. 
Okay. All right. Please proceed, Mr. Rosendahl. Yes, good afternoon. Hi. Uh, Chris Morita, Assistant General Manager from the Library. Okay. Last night I was in Venice and my constituents went um, very upset because they were told that the Venice Branch Library was going to close on Saturdays. Um, I obviously had no notice from anybody about when you were closing or not closing. Um, I'm now told it's Sunday and Monday. Yes or no? Yes. Uh, we just uh, completed negotiations with the unions and we just uh, developed the new schedule that will take effect on July 18th and that schedule will be that all 73 libraries will be open Tuesday through Saturdays. And why? At how is it determined that Sunday, which is another day of rest, but also an opportunity for people to use libraries, did you look at the stats of when the library is the busiest? Yes, we did. And what was Sunday like compared to Monday, Tuesday? Sundays, we were only open in nine libraries on Sundays. And Historically. That's, and that was the Central Library and the nine regional libraries, West LA and your uh, district. And we closed Sundays in April when we lost the EREP staff. So we've been closed Sundays since April. So um, Sunday is not an issue, as you're right. saying it, because right. the, rec the 73 libraries weren't open on Sunday anyhow. Well, correct. The, the regional branch libraries were. So we haven't reduced any of the evening time or morning time through the rest of the week. We did, in April, we did reduce the evening times. Instead of being open four evenings, we're only open two evenings. Remember, we lost 328 positions, and that, that's a 28% decrease in staff. Okay, so where are we now on the volunteerism turning into a We hope to um, submit the report next week to Budget and Finance. And Do you think that might give us an opportunity to keep libraries open later in some of the nights and stuff like that, some of that? Being able to work uh, I, th on. I think we're looking at all of those options, so we'll, it'll be discussed in the report. Very good. So the notice has gone out to, to everybody that right. Monday. This morning, the notice people. went out to all the council members that okay. all the libraries will be open Tuesday through Saturday. Very good. Thank you very much for that. All right. Now uh, uh, I need an admonition from the city attorney so that we can go into closed session. Council is. Authorized to go into closed session under the labor negotiations exception under government code section 54957.6 to receive a briefing from its labor negotiator or to give directions. Please uh, secure uh, the council chamber so that we can go into closed session. And please let me know when uh, the chamber is secure.
Thank you very much. Uh, we are live back in session. Los Angeles City Council. Uh, we have just lost quorum, so the meeting is adjourned. Thank you very much. All right, we can do announcements, and we cannot do adjourning motions. Okay. Mr. Huizar has an announcement. I'd like to make an announcement that uh, this coming Tuesday, we will adjourn uh, in memory of Matthew Benjamin Butcher, son of SEIU 721. Uh, leader Julie Butcher. Um, Matthew was shot and killed yesterday afternoon when armed robbers broke in the, into the Echo Park medical marijuana shop where he worked. Matthew was just 27 years old. According to those who knew him, Matt was kind, decent, quiet young man, proud of his strong analytical and mathematical skills. He worked many tax seasons with Robert Hall and Associates in Glendale. An Eagle Rock High School graduate, class of 2001, Matthew loved golf. His brother Stephen, his mom's unit work, and his dad Don's ever-present love and support. He was a huge soccer fan and was rooting for the USA to win the World Cup. If they do, we'll be in the some small part in his memory. Matt's family is devastated by this unexpected loss. They abhor the senseless violence that took his life as well as that of another worker at a clinic in Hollywood. One of Michael's colleagues at the Echo Park shop was also badly injured. Members, I'm sure on Tuesday we will all want to join in on this adjourning motion, and we send our condolences to his family, as well as those of the other families uh, who were injured, and to Julie Butcher. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Huizar. Um, we will take that up again on Tuesday when we have a quorum. And are there, Mr. Parks has yes. an announcement. Yes, I have a couple of announcements. One, we want to invite the public and any of my colleagues on Saturday, June the 26th, 10 a.m. to 6 p.m., we're having a uh, Lamert Park, the fourth annual Lamert Park book fair in the Vision parking lot. It's a, uh, it's a free event. We'd also like to invite the public to a two events on June the 30th. One, uh, a long-awaited meeting uh, with the LAD uh, LAWA to talk about noise issues in the South Los Angeles area. This will be Wednesday, June 30th, 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. at the Constituent Center at 8475 South Vermont. And then my final one is that we have the, the um, let's see, the last, oh, Crenshaw LAX Transit Corridor meeting is June 30th, uh, Wednesday, 6 to 8 at Lula Washington Dance Theater. And that's where they're asking the public to come out and talk about the uh, Crenshaw line that is being, uh, that was approved. Uh, and it's primarily going to be dealing with the uh, uh, the station that is, um, let's see, the Merck Park station. Thank you, Mr. Parks. There are no further announcements. Our meeting is adjourned due to lack of.